Okay, good morning. I'll call to order the February 7th, 2022 uh, regular meeting of the Haywood County Bo Board of Commissioners. Our first order of business will be the Pledge of Allegiance, and after that, I'm going to have our pastor, Josh Frazier, come forward for the invocation. So, if everyone please stand for the pledge. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today asking for guidance and wisdom and support as we begin this meeting. Help us to engage in meaningful discussion and allow us to grow closer as a group and nurture the bonds of community here in Haywood. Fill us with your grace as we make decisions that might affect our community and continue to remind us that all that we do here today, all that we accomplish is for the pursuit of goodness and the service of humanity. We thank you for the opportunity to live in an area where your handiwork is greatly displayed. What a beautiful county we live in. We thank you for that. I thank you for each one of our commissioners, our county manager, all the staff that it takes to run our county and our government here our law enforcement, and others that keep our homes safe. I'll also ask for your hand of blessing on each one of these that I just mentioned. Again, we ask for your guidance and your wisdom today. We ask these things in your name, and amen. Thank you, Pastor Josh. Our next, our next order of business will be our public comment session. I do have several people that have signed up to speak. Uh, please limit your comment to three minutes. And Tracy will be keeping the time, and she'll just, uh, if you would, when she lets you know your time's up, if you would, just finish up your comment so we can move on to the next speaker. And uh, our first person to sign up to speak is Ellen Pitt. Ellen, welcome this morning. Thank you. I have a couple of documents for each of you in these folders. If you can't hear me. So good morning. I'm speaking to you today on behalf of the Western North Carolina Grandparents Coalition and on behalf of the children of Western North Carolina and beyond. I present to you two of the most ridiculous documents that you may ever see. And both of them were generated by the Haywood County Department of Social Services. And in both cases and thousands of others across the state, the people with the most information and insight who are most impacted by DSS decisions were denied a seat at the table. If they had not been denied that seat, there are some children who may be alive today. Over the past 21 years, I've interacted with Child Protective Services in many counties, and except in the cases of my two endangered grandchildren, it was on behalf of children whose names I will never know. The people and the children of North Carolina have tolerated a level of arrogance, incompetence, corruption, and ignorance from DSS that would never be tolerated from any other agency. For just a few examples, and I have all these documents over here if you'd like to see them, I point to the Union County case of a CPS supervisor, Wanda Larson, who left a child out in the cold with a dead chicken tied around her neck, to the Haywood County cases of Adriana Early, Kyler Presnell, and Chloe Evans, just to name a few, to the Swain County case of Aubrey Littlejohn, the Buncombe County cases of Gabriel Duckett and a little girl who was rescued by officers just recently because they refused after DSS told them to leave her in a Super 8 motel room full of drugs and dirty needles with a man her daddy had only met that day named Stanley. And then there's always the 30 multi-million dollar lawsuits going on in Cherokee County as we speak. In January 2016, I sat in a room with a Miss Donna Lepton, whose name appears along with the infamous Mr. Stoney Blevins on one of the documents that you now have. 
She declared in front of a room full of officers, the sheriff, and a sitting state senator that she had no knowledge of a law that had been passed to protect children against alcohol abusers four years before that. Senate Bill 693, which was fought for by Western North Carolina legislators, will go far to stop the DSS workers from arbitrarily withholding information from oversight committees. And we at the Western North Carolina Grandparents Coalition will lobby to hold DSS criminally accountable for their corruption and incompetence when they fail a child to death. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Appreciate you coming out today. Our next uh, person to sign up to speak is Kimberly Freeman. Welcome, Kimberly. Thank you. My name is Kimberly Freeman, and I'm also with WNC Grandparent Coalition. Um, since we only have three minutes, I actually have something to read to you. I want to begin by saying recently, DSS agency put an article in the newspaper. It read, being, being a caseworker is incredibly stressful and emotionally draining job. Well, try being a grandparent that's kept from your grandchildren by parents who refuse to, because you refuse to enable their drug addiction by giving them money. So your grandchildren are kept from you by them. In the meantime, they are being used as punching bags until finally that's not enough. So they fill your 10-month-old granddaughter so full of alcohol and drugs and brutally beat her till she's brain dead and left lying on the floor while they continue their drug use. Watch their bro you watch their brothers and their sisters suffer, crying and falling apart, asking Mamma why. It's something that you cannot even answer yourself. I wake up every morning and go to bed every night with the fact your, with the fact that your granddaughter is taken from you in such a horrific way and absolutely nothing you could have done because you were never notified by any of any abuse going on and you being the biological parent, uh, paternal grandparents. I think about Chloe every single day as much as I despise drugs. Say that with the amount of drugs that was in her system that just maybe that day it was enough to numb her pain from the beating a grown man couldn't bear. So until your agency can look at me and tell me that you have lived this kind of pain, then don't dare tell me how incredible stressful and emotional draining it is because I will live with this for the rest of my life. You, to your agency, it's just another case to close. In a letter sent out by your agency, you stated simply using drugs in the child's presence does not meet the definition of neglect. And the house does not show that the child's welfare is at serious risk or harm. However, the majority of children being murdered, drugs are a contributing factor. Your system failed my granddaughter as well as continues to fail other children. We have founded WNC Grandparents Coalition in order to advocate on the behalf of abused and neglected children who are being failed by a system designed to protect them. Early intervention can make an enormous difference in a child's life because by the time a case gets to court, it's often too late. And the maze of bureaucratic agency and legal system that is often stacked against the child and continue to endanger these children rather than protect them. It's time to put children first and stop protecting the criminals and portraying the agency as the victims. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Kimberly. Our next person signed up to speak is Jane Webb. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jane Webb. I'm Collar Presnell's grandmother. I am a founder of uh, the Western North Carolina Grandparents Coalition. I'm a lot stronger than I was in 2016 whenever I came in front of y'all and I was told that DSS was overworked. They had too many cases. Well, I'm here today to tell you I'm overworked too. I have many clients, one with me today, that I had to bring. When we have too many clients, guess what? We work overtime. I also went to the Sheriff's Department over 10 years ago. I addressed many problems with them about drugs in our county because I had children on meth. I gave them addresses up there. Tony Cope, Greg Christopher, I don't know if he's here today, Jeff Haynes, quite a few of them that I spoke to numerous times. Addresses and names, nothing was done. 
all of a sudden it becomes election year and everything seems to be a big issue now. Well, it's been an issue for the last 10 years that I know of, that I've tried to get my children off drugs, that I tried to save my grandchildren's lives, and one that I still have intensive therapy with today. Because, you know, we don't have child therapy here in Haywood County. We don't have PTRFs. You know where I had to send my grandson? South Carolina. You know where I had to go visit twice a week? South Carolina. Because our funding is exactly nowhere where it needs to be. We need to fund our children. We need to get these drugs out of our county. And we need to pay attention. I have a whole exhibit here, a whole exhibit A, and I would be happy to pass it around if any of you want to see it, of these children that was left in this home with this mother. They witnessed stabbings. Methamphetamine was left with a sex offender that had been charged and convicted alone. A little girl, a little five-year-old girl left alone. And it goes on and on just keep enabling this mother that is strung out on meth. These kids are witnessing domestic violence. They're left to walk the streets alone, searching for their mother, while this social worker keeps enabling them. We don't need this. This is why our kids are dying. And the, really, the root of the problem, the root of the problem here in Haywood County is drugs. If we do not do something about the drugs, in our county, it's going to continue to decline. We're going to continue to bury our children and our grandchildren. We have to do something about it. We have to take a stand. We should have done it a long time ago. Many drug houses should have been busted a long time ago. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you, Jane. Okay, our next person signed up to speak is Caleb Bumgarner. Welcome, Caleb. The thing that I came here to speak about today is I am the one that had the intensive, intensive in-home therapy because my baby brother got murdered by the hands of the paternal grandparents. The thing about our families is that they have no power whenever the people that do have power do absolutely nothing to help. That's what I've learned the hard way about polit politics, is that some people just decide not to help, if they ha even if they do have the power, and they decide to hide whenever they... All of a sudden, whenever something bad happened, they're no longer responsible. And that's the only reason I wanted to come here today. It's that anyone that comes to houses and takes children and moves them to drug houses, for example, have power and they don't use it correctly. They like to put, it, put them in spot and then leave all of their authority in one spot. Whilst the family has no authority to do anything, the person that left them there just leaves them there to die. That's the only thing I wanted to talk to you guys about. Okay, th thank you, Caleb. Appreciate you coming out this morning. Our next per person to sign up to speak is Lisa Scruggs. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. I'm with the WNC Grandparents Coalition. I'm, not, I'm a grandparent, but I'm not here for my grandchild. I'm here for my niece and nephew. Two nieces and a nephew. Kind of pull the mic down so we can hear you. There you right. go. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Two nieces and a nephew. My struggles with this was 2003 when I had to get custody of my oldest niece because the mother was a meth addict. Court order removed her from the mother's custody. In 2017, she had another child. When the child was three months old, this is a safety plan from DSS. Just part of it. Please, please talk into there. Nobody can hear you. Okay. This is a safety plan from DSS. Part of it. 
my sister had produced two positive drugs amphetamine. And, a, and the child, who was three months old, tested positive for marijuana. Yet it says she is able to provide a safe environment for the child, free from drugs. They left her there, did a safety plan. She walked all through that safety plan. What started the DSS investigation was a domestic violence situation. She went and took out a DVPO on the father. When the deputy went to remove the father, he had been the one beat up. So the deputy took a warrant out on my sister. They arrested her. So they left the child with a, an abuser, a meth user, and it goes on and on and on. It does not stop there. DSS continued to do safety plan after safety plan after safety plan. If they're overworked, they created themselves. They would close a case. Two or three months later, it was reopened for the same thing. They are creating work for their self. My husband and I had to spend $35,000 to get custody. She has two kids. One was born addicted or substance abused, a newborn. She used methamphetamine when she was pregnant with him. They let her take him home with the father that she now has a judgment of no contact against. And they got married, by the way, in that judgment in place here in Haywood County. They, they let the father be the supervisor of both those kids and the meth. But we have custody of them now. And you say it's detrimental to a child, remove them from their parents? No. The oldest has PTSD and a child under six. The youngest was left in a car seat in a high chair constantly. He has no core muscles. He is developmentally delayed. We have to see counselors. We are busy all week because they were left in that situation by DSS. At any point in time, they could have filed a petition. I've had to file emergency custody for these kids twice because a judge here in this county let her have overnight visits with them, at which time I was called twice by law enforcement to pick them up on the side of the road because she had meth with her and the kids. The first time, the kids were strapped into their car seat, but the car seats were not tethered to the car. They were free floating. And I was told that was a seatbelt violation. The second time, she had meth in reach of the minor child and was charged with child abuse. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for coming out this morning. Would anyone else like to address the board this morning that's here? I see no one. I'll close the public comment session. Um, our next uh, order of business is constituent concerns. Does anybody have any? Express this morning. <clears throat> I want to give a shout out to uh, you know. Sometimes people contact us with solutions, and here a while back we had uh, to close the convenience centers, and we had a constituent email us and say, "Why don't you put that out on Haywood Alerts?" And it was like, "Wow, yeah, we should be doing that." So his name was Jeff Maccabee, and I just want to give a shout out to him for. Uh, giving us that and, and, and really any other information we can push out would be good to use that. So if, if they want to use Haywood Alerts, Brian, how do they do that? Do you know? Don't you sign up for that on your mobile phone? There should be a link on our website if you want to sign up to get uh, okay. text notifications. I'll, I'll, I'll work with Joey to make sure it's on the front screen so uh, okay. people will see it up, up at the top. Okay. So, you know, if y'all don't have Haywood Alerts, it's a good uh, tool to, to let you know uh, when the county needs to get out information. So, okay. Thank you, Brian. Does anyone have any cons other constituent concerns? I, I would like to say something before you, especially to the young man that spoke, in case y'all leave, I think we're going to have a long meeting. To come and speak publicly in any public forum is a very American thing to do. And I'm very sorry that you had to speak on this topic, but I, I don't know you, but I'm very proud of the fact that you had the gumption to stand up and say what was on your mind. We, we need to exercise that right as Americans to speak about the things that are important to us. So um, these ladies and the rest of you that are part of that grandparents coalition, it's um, difficult to be sometimes the feet to the message, and that's very hard. And I appreciate that you're sharing what is so heavy and weighty for you that you will live with the rest of your life to save, potentially save another child. So, but again, the, Caleb, I appreciate you doing that. That's very brave of you. Thank you. Um, 
I'd just like to respond just a, just a second to that and because we, we are county commissioners and we represent the county. Um, and most of you know I've been a practicing attorney for 27 years. And so when I first started practicing law, I represented parents and attempted to try to get their kids back from the Department of Social Services. Um, and you know, that, I was appointed to do that kind of work. And I did the very best I could, and, but a lot of my clients weren't exactly the most exemplary people in the world. But they have certain rights. Parents have certain rights. They have rights over grandparents' rights. They have rights over aunts' rights. And when DSS is performing their job, they have to respect that. They have to comply with that. And anybody who sits in the court of law, and I know Ms. Pitt does quite often, um, knows that. And so um, it, it, it's not easy for DSS to pick and choose exactly who they're going to take from somebody's a, a child from somebody's home. And they have to go through certain steps to do that. And um, I mean, certainly these cases, we'll, we'll take a look at those, but uh, I just want the public to know that, you know, they are overworked and they do as good a job as I think they can. Now, if they don't and it's reported, then I'm sure there's some disciplinary process to that. Um, the other thing that we're just completely overlooking in this process when we talk about this is the fact of who is really responsible first? Who brought the children into this world? And that's those parents. And every one of you are, are you're either grandparents or you're an aunt. But the parents have not taken the responsibility that they're supposed to take. And I'm sure you've gotten on those folks about that. And, and I think in our nation, and, and of course I'm, I'm certainly more worried about our county, is the parents aren't taking responsibility. And that's, that may be caused because of drug problems that need to be shut down. But then there's also the laws that protect people's rights from coming into people's homes for just anything. For example, when you gave that list of names to Sheriff Christopher, I mean, Sheriff Christopher can't just go take a warrant and just open the door and go in the house. I mean, they've got, they've got to go through a process. And those same processes that they have to go through are the same things that other people are fighting for right now and trying to say, well, we need to have our constitutional rights. We need to have the right to bear arms and the right to, against search and seizure. Well, and then we have folks that ask, well, just go, just go get them. Well, it, it's, you can't, they can't do that. And, and I'm not getting on to you about it. I just want to explain to you that the process is a lot more difficult than just somebody screwed up and let's get them because they're the wrong person to do it. I mean, this is, it's, it's, an, it's a complicated problem. And it starts at home, and then it starts um, infiltrating and getting worse because of drug situation and people making wrong decisions. So um, I just want to say that, that I'm supportive until someone can show me specific things that the Haywood County Department of Social Services did wrong, I'm going to support the Haywood County Department of Social Services because I know how difficult it was when I represented parents to try to do to protect children at that point in time. If it's changed, you know, we'll take a look at it. But, uh, and I appreciate the fact that you, that you come forward and do speak your mind. I think everybody ought to be able to speak their mind, uh, you know, whether I agree or disagree or, or have an opinion on it. But um, I just I didn't think it was, un, I just thought it was unfair for DSS to take a big hit like that at, at public comment without some support for them. Are we allowed to respond to that? No. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, Brandon, did you have something you want to say? Uh, I just want to say as well as uh, Commissioner uh, Bess said, the young man that come and spoke, that was awful brave of him. I, I couldn't have done something like that myself when I was his age. I have a problem <coughs> enough now speaking in front of public, and I turned 51, I think, this year. Somebody might have to correct me on that. Can't even remember. But uh, uh, kudos to him, you know, brave young man to come up and speak like that. I want you guys to know that I did hear you. I heard what you said. I am the commissioner representative on the health board. And, and I take the, the matters that you brought today seriously. I want to investigate those. Uh, I'm going to speak to the folks in charge, and I want to look into those because, as uh, Kirk said, if there's it is what we're doing, uh, it needs to be corrected, it needs to be fixed. And my heart goes out. I've had many phone calls since I've been a commissioner of uh, grandparents that have called 
and had concerns for their grandchildren. And I'm getting to the age now to where I'm going to have grandchildren one day, so it hits close to home, knowing that I could be in that same situation. So I take those matters seriously. I want to look into them and investigate them. Uh, again, I think we've got a great uh, social services department. Uh, if we do have any wrongdoing going on there, it will be investigated and we'll deal with it. I can promise you that. I'd like to echo uh, what my fellow commissioners have said. I appreciate y'all coming today. And uh, I know when I first became a commissioner, I hadn't been on, on the board just a few months, and I got a phone call from some grandparents. And uh, very heart-wrenching. Uh, very heart-wrenching brought me to tears, the situation that their grandchildren were in. And I, I sympathize with you, and I, <clears throat> I echo what, what every commissioner has said. I agree with everything that's been said. I do agree <clears throat> that children starts at home. And uh, I've always been an advocate of getting your children in church, getting a good foundation, getting parents who know how to parent. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the foundation of the house. And you get them started off right, there's no... <clears throat> Silver bullet. I know. Uh, I know cases where kids have gotten involved with drugs. I used to work with a guy that did everything right, and uh, he always said he told his children, first drink, never take that first hit of drugs, because you might like it." Is the juice worth the squeeze? Is it worth the risk? Is it a necessity of life? Uh, we need to ask our children that. We need to instill that in their children, instill that in their parents, and uh, try to head this thing off before it becomes a problem. And I agree, there needs to be something done with the drug situation in this county. Uh, I know our sheriff's department's working on it. Uh, we have occasional drug busts. Uh, it's complicated, but uh, I'm, I'm with you. I'm an advocate of stopping this drug trade in our, in our county that's ruining lives. So I, I sympathize with everybody that's spoken here today. And thank you for coming. I uh, thank the young man that came and spoke about his brother. Appreciate that. Okay. Then, anyone else have anything? Okay, we'll move on to administrative agency reports and presentations. Their first uh, presentation will be the Library Board of Trustees advocacy presentation with their Library Board Trustee, Gene Dilley. Welcome, Jean. Appreciate you coming out today. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, although I must say that's a tough um, group to follow considering what they have been through and what they're doing. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Jean Dilley. I sit on the Board of Trustees for the Haywood County Public Library. I want to thank the other trustee members and the library staff for being here to support me as we go through this process. As you can see, the comment here is library elite and that's kind of a like okay you're on the board and you're telling me obs libraries are obsolete no I'm that's a myth and that's a mis misconception of a lot of people I have the internet why would I need the library here's an overview we did some brainstorming the internet versus a library and you can take a look at these I'm not going to read them to you and I'm sure that you can come up with even more differentiators that prove that the library is a valuable entity. One of the things that I want to really p point out is the algorithm per personalization. One of the problems with the internet is once you've been on there for a while, you keep getting fed the same information over and over and over again. When you go into the library and you search for information, you have staff that is willing to take the time to show you the different viewpoints and the different perspectives of things that you're trying to research. So you're getting a wide picture of it as opposed to a myopic view of it. There's a, there's a, a relative new internet company called NewsGuard. And interestingly enough, they have individual journalists evaluate websites and they've evaluated about 95% of all the websites that are out there and they rate them based on nine criteria. It's apolitical, they give you the source, but the really interesting statistic is that 40% of those websites fail as far as accuracy. 
So that really makes you stop to think, do I really want to be out there and making my decisions on the internet? And I'm sure that every single one of you has gone down that rabbit hole where you're searching for information and you start that trek and a half an hour later you do not have the answer to your question. You just have more questions. And I'm telling you that if you go into the library and you work with the staff in the library, you've got a guide on that trip down the rabbit hole and you have someone to get you past the, the, the red knight to show you the Cheshire cat, to point out Tweedledee and Tweedledum and to get you out the other side. So you've got a benefit there by having a personalization going on in the library that you don't have when you go onto the internet. One of the things that the library did was hold a um, focus groups. Uh, we were looking to what, what works, what doesn't work, where do we need improvement. And one of the participants in the Canton survey, or the Canton um, focus group said, the library is the non-biased source for information, and I think that pretty much says it all. Um, and I really appreciate that, that foresight. Now, moving on, obviously, the library does have an internet component. And one of the things that we can do in the library is to help you ask the right questions. Sometimes you know what the answer is, but you don't know, or the answer that you're looking for, but you don't know how to get that question. And working with somebody as part of the team, we can help walk you through that process. Here's some interesting statistics. This represents the relationship between the community and the library. I'm pretty sure that when you look at the 63,000 number there, you'll realize that that's the number of residents in Haywood County. About half of those people, 29,000, have library cards. But the really interesting statistic is the 506,000. And that's the number of points of contact people have made within a library within one calendar year. And that does not include people who have walked in the library to take out books or to look for resources, or people who have parked in the parking lot of the library to use Wi-Fi. So you can see what an integral part of the community the library represents. During the pandemic, the buildings may not have been open, but the library was never closed. You see up here the ease of the Hayward County Public Library. The American Library Association has challenged the board of directors for all libraries to come up with some kind of memory device that encourages people to think about, talk about the library in a common, singular voice. And so the board sat down and figured out what they felt were the most important E's. And they came up with empowerment, education, and everyone. Empowerment, what does that mean? Well, it, it means to go explore the new and the unknown. It gives you an opportunity to change the way you look at things, to try new languages, new recipes, new music, to be entertained in ways you've ne never been entertained before, to read books about science fiction, to learn more about yourself and to kind of from the thought process that you've had as a, as a kid growing up. It gives you an opportunity for new locations and new job growth and new business opportunities. So it's really a freeing and empowering you to go into the library and to explore. Education obviously is a major component of the library. Who benefits from education? Anybody that chooses to walk through those doors or to get onto the website to look for more information. It's available to everyone. It's information on anything and it's entertainment in both written and audio formats. It's available in the county through four, four physical locations as well as via the internet. And the library has really tackled the, uh, the prospect of the problem of broadband by making hotspots available for rent for people in those areas that do not have uh, good internet connectivity. So we're doing everything we can to reach out to the community and to support that community.
everyone, obviously the library is available to everyone, not just within the community, but the visitors that come into Haywood County on a regular basis in the summertime, and the part-time residents that come in here and, and spend their time in Haywood County. Libraries are considered the third safest place. Your first is your home, your second is your workplace, and the library is considered the third safest community space available. It's, it's a private space for small business owners to meet. It may be an opportunity to do a telehealth conference. There are so many applications for the library. It's only limited by our imagination. Here's how the library has supported the community. Uh, you know the library staff has stepped up during the pandemic to, fund hot, to run hotlines. Uh, you may not know that before the Hazelwood Soap Company came into effect, the owners were in the library doing all sorts of research on what they needed to do to become a viable company. There's outreach in the community in so many ways, the Pigeon Community Center. If you've walked around the, the rec center, you've seen the library and the information, the story time there. There's been a recent connection between the library and the business community. We are a viable partner within that community. Now we turn around and ask, how can you support us? Well, if you don't have a library card, get one. Um, you can talk, you can advocate for the library. You can encourage people to visit the library. Uh, you can volunteer for the library. You can visit the Friends Use Bookshop on Marshall Street. And there again, donations, participation volunteerism. There are so many ways to support the library, but one of the things we want to make sure is that we're getting out there and we're getting a voice. Uh, we do not want to be a well-kept secret. In fact, in the chamber office, we even have rack cards for the library. We know when visitors come in, that's one of the cards that we give out to them. You've got to visit our local library. We have a, 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 a woman living in this community who grew up in Poland has traveled and lived throughout the world, and she told me that she thought this was one of the best libraries that she'd ever been to. And considering that this is a small community, I think that's a major kudo. So, wrap the ease of the library are it empowers, it educates, and it's for everyone. Libraries are a community space, a neighborhood gathering place. Uh, the Washington Post on January 1st had an article and it made the comment that said communities that invest in libraries are well prepared for whatever the next chapter brings. And I thank you all for supporting the Haywood County Public Library System. Thank you. Does anyone have any comments on that? I just want to follow that and thank Gene for, for coming. This is something that we discussed at um, several of our meetings. I'm on the, the uh, board uh, or one of the trustees of, of the library and we have several of them here today. I, I guess everybody can just raise their hand. If you're, if you're a trustee, raise your hand. And then after that, if you're an employee there, raise your hand. So uh, there is a lot of support for the library. And, and one of the things and in, in how Gene opened that up was, was something I suppose you know, I'd asked or talked to uh, the board about over a year ago is the fact that because you know any anybody who's thinking about it goes well you know why do you need a library we can just get on the internet and find anything and and you know more and more we're learning now that everything you find on the internet is not accurate and you can't and, and it's hard to get the right query to get what you need from the internet and um, so the the library is a place you can actually trust the source you have act, actual help from folks uh, there that can assist you in what you need to find and um, th there's a lot of things that go on at the library and people just don't realize that and so I just wanted you all to realize how important that library is and, and how it cannot be replaced by the internet and and a great support group that we have right now with the library and so uh, they're doing a lot of good things I'm always impressed each time I go to a meeting how enthusiastic they are about the library and um, Thank you very much for coming today. I went to one of the um, focus group meetings that Kathy held at the Canton Library, and I've commented to several people about how enthusiastic those participants were. And when I was first seated, one of the first 
um, request I had from the community was please take care of our libraries. So you're very important, and I, I do appreciate what you do. It's um, not, I don't want to say overlooked, but if you don't use it, you don't realize just how vital it is. So get the library cards. One thing I'll say along with what Kirk said is uh, you may think the Internet's the place to go to, but a lot of folks don't have Internet, so they have to go to the library to look at the Internet. So uh, I was the same way when I was elected. Uh, to be honest with you, and, uh, to be frank, uh, I thought, well, who needs the library anymore? Uh, and since I have been elected in 2016, boy, have I realized how important the library is. So, and, and not only that, but the folks that use it. You know, I think she said there's 506,000 contacts. You know, think about that for just a minute. That's a lot of contacts. A lot of good information at the library. And if you don't do nothing else but do the library parking lot and use the Internet, it's well worth it. Thank you guys for what you do. We support Thanks for everything's been said. <laughs> yeah, and I did want to say, too, a few years ago, I think y'all were having an anniversary or something, but I remember they were talking about the history of the Haywood County Library, and it was very impressive how it started, and, and I don't remember, I just remember it started maybe in a small room, maybe it was in Canton or Waynesville, I forget, but anyway, uh, but it was pretty, it was, it, was, it was very interesting on how it started and, and how we had some really um, forward-looking people, you know, get the library started here in Haywood County, and the other thing is when we interview people for the library board. I'm always impressed with how uh, maybe they're not from our community originally and they've moved here, but they they uh, are so impressed with the what our library does, and it's always um, it, and it's just good that, to know that our community cares for the library and that uh, and they use it. You know, it's it's used a lot. I know you, you you'd think well everybody just goes online and does does things, but but it. Does. You know, they, they don't. They need the library to do that. And I was wondering if I could ask a question for, the, for Kathy. Uh, if I was talking with Vicki at the Mountaineer, it, the Mountaineer, all their, their issues are online, I or not online, but on microfilm. But are they online? They are. We've been working to digitize the, the Mountaineer. Um, we started that process about two years ago. Um, we received um, a nice donation from the Lawrence Trust. Uh, Lawrence Ross family and we were able to take some of those funds and digitize everything going back to the the very first Mountaineer issue back in the 1800s and so we've we've continued that process and the latest is through the end of 20 we have online that's open to anyone who goes through our website you don't have to have a card to access that content so really anybody from anywhere could access the local newspaper and the it's the full newspaper just as it looked back then as it looks today so it, it's really a, a very valuable resource it's almost like a pdf it is and it's the history of the county really if you think about the newspapers over correct time. so you've got it all the way from 2020 back that's correct scanned. and mm -hmm. so you can go online if you mm -hmm. want to look the reason i asked was my wife was needing her father's obituary and he died in the early nine early mm -hmm. 90s mm -hmm. and so uh I Vicky and I was like, well, do y'all have those? And she's like, well, I think the library did that. So, yeah. um, so I'm going to look for that. And uh, Yeah, it's and, very searchable. Um, yeah. Really, you can put in any keyword and find exactly what you're looking for and photos and, and everything. Yeah. It's wonderful. Back about 20 years ago, I'm kind of a history buff, and I was wondering, you know, being in an elected office, I went back and I looked at the elections from, and you always knew it was, you know, the, the Mountaineer would have their Wednesday edition after the election, uh, November, you know, the first whatever, in November, the first Tuesday. Um, and, and so I, and at that time, the Mountaineer would always put a grid of the offices. So you had the list of names on one side and the town on the other, on the other column, then you had the totals. And you had it all the way down through there. And it was a really nifty way to look up election totals. Mm -hmm. Of course, those were unofficial, but and they were pretty, you know, pretty much what it was. And so I did some research on finding out who won and when and things like that, how the presidents have fared in Haywood County. And it was kind of a neat thing. But I, I remember I went to the library and I got on a microfilm. It's been about 20 years ago. got on a microfilm machine and I would just get those issues and I'd go back to that date and look at it. So if well, you want to... 
We still do have the microfilm as part of the process of digitizing. We still mm -hmm. have the microfilm okay. also because some people just like that nostalgia. <laughs> yeah. But we have updated our equipment also so that it's much easier to search and, and, and easier to print out things um, once you do find what you're looking for in microfilm yeah. and you don't mind getting dizzy just looking through yeah. the reels. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So if, if you know a date in history and you want to know how it got reported, you can go back and, mm -hmm. and look at those issues around that time and, and see what happens. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I appreciate, appreciate your wisdom in doing that and having that at our fingertips instead of having to you know, go to the library. Yes. So the library does a lot of things that you can go on your computer and do mm -hmm. that, that might be helpful as well as go to the library. So, mm -hmm. but, so you guys are there with your presence no matter where. <laughs> Right. Thank so, you. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. I appreciate that. Okay. Our next uh, agency report is the Friends of the Smokies update. We have our Director of Development, Marielle DeJong. Is that correct? If I butchered your name, please correct me. <laughs> okay. Thanks for coming out today. Thank you for having me. Okay. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, well, my name is Marielle, uh, and I am not from Haywood County. I'm from Over the Ridge in Transylvania County, and I now live in Asheville, uh, and I work for Friends of the Smokies as the Director of Development, and uh, for the last six years, that's where I've been, and I am excited to be here today, so thank you. Um, this is probably a bit of a review session for all of you. This is territory here, um, so I appreciate your patience. I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit about the park, uh, Friends of the Smokies' role, and um, some of the challenges the park is facing. Um, so the Smokies is about 800 square miles um, and about a half million acres, and it runs on the North Carolina and Tennessee border. A great deal of it is here in Haywood County. Uh, in addition to being a national park, it is also a UNESCO uh, World Heritage Site. It is part of an international biosphere reserve, and it is part of the Blue Ridge National Heritage Area. Um, not only is it the most visited national park, which is a, a superlative I think we're probably all familiar with, it is also the most biodiverse national park in America. Um, it is the home of 65 mammals, uh, 1,500 flowering plants. It has more different types of species of trees than all of, all of Europe. Um, and all in all, 20,000 different types of life uh, call the Smokies home. Uh, when visitors come to the park, they have a lot of opportunity for recreation, including 11 picnic areas, 10 front country campgrounds, five horse camps, and seven group campgrounds. Um, it's also a place for adventure. Uh, it has 900 miles of trails. It's a hiker's paradise. Um, it also has scenic driveways, much like the Blue Ridge Parkway. <coughs> Uh, it has 100 backcountry campsites and over 800 miles of fishable waters. Uh, the Smokies also provides historical and cultural lessons for all of us. Um, it is a place of continuing human history. Many people before us called the Smokies home before it was established as a national park in 1934, um, and their stories continue to be told today. There are over 100 each of um, cemeteries in the park as well as historic structures. So the Smokies really is America's national park. Um, as we've already noted, it is the most visited national park in America. And one of the reasons for that is over half of the population of this country live within a day's driving distance to the Smokies. Um, and you all probably know that because here in Haywood County, many of the visitors who come to the Smokies stay here. Um, the numbers really speak for themselves. When I sent this presentation in to Mr. Francis, uh, the numbers for 2021 had not come out yet, but I'm sure we've all seen in the news that uh, last year nearly 2 million more people came to the Smokies, so 14 people visited Great Smoky Mountains National Park last year. And as you can see by comparison to the other <coughs> national parks, um, it's not even close. Uh, there are a lot of people visiting the Smokies and, and making memories there, which is a good thing. Um, but this isn't just America's National Park, it truly is Haywood County's National Park. Um, and I say that because I know that having worked in this community, um, say it is your National Park, it's Haywood County's National Park, I know that that is a sense of ownership that comes with a sense of stewardship. Um, Haywood County is home to the, the famous Catalucci Valley, uh, and I imagine that there are people in this room who have connections to folks who once lived here, whether it's your family members or your friends that once lived in Catalucci Valley, so I don't imagine I need to tell you what a special place that is. 
Um, but Haywood County is also home to some of the, par uh, the parks, in my opinion, most beautiful views. That's Purchase Knob there in the center. Um, and it's looking straight at Haywood County there. Um, and then incredible watersheds like Big Creek, which is home to the famous Midnight Home Hole, of course. And the elk, uh, which are ever present, and it's a growing number. Um, but Haywood County was the site nearly, our, we've now rounded the corner on 20 years ago. The elk were reintroduced in Cataloochee, and uh, remains probably the best place in the park to see elk throughout the year. Maybe some of you saw them on your drive-in. Um, but the park isn't just a place to, to visit, it truly is an economic engine. An estimated $1.38 billion in economic benefits uh, were generated by the park in 2020 to all of the Gateway communities. Um, the park supports 14,000 jobs with 14 million visitors who came last year. The park also faces challenges. You know, it's a double-edged sword, all of that visitation. But many of the challenges that it faces, when you look at that root cause, it is shortfalls in funding. Um, and when you don't have enough funding, that can result in things like delayed maintenance of infrastructure, whether that's roads that don't get paved in a timely fashion or buildings that need repairs that don't see them when they need those repairs. Um, it can also mean recreational closures. So that can be the closure of an entire campground, or it might be that there's a flood on a trail and they can't reopen it quickly because there aren't enough resources, whether that's staffing or materials or a combination. Um, it can also mean the loss of historic uh, landscapes and structures. So we've really seen in the last month that mountain weather can be hard, and that can really take a toll on historic structures. Um, and when you don't have that, that staffing and those resources, it can be really hard to keep up. Um, and really, when you have 14 million people in a concentrated area, um, accidents are going to happen. But when you don't have the right uh, funding and you aren't able to meet the needs, that means that people can receive help um, at not the rate that we would want them to. It strains on counties like Haywood, because Haywood, maybe more than any other county, plays a role in providing support to search and rescue operations in the park. And I know there have been high profile ones in recent years. And, um, Y'all's search and rescue teams here have been a really big part of that. Um, but all in all, the number that we've seen probably before, and I know that the Blue Ridge Parkway has a similar and even higher number, is a $235 million maintenance backlog. And I just want to reiterate, I am I'm very excited to be here to talk about what Friends of the Smokies does, but with a number like that, with $235 million in a maintenance backlog, and, and that doesn't even address year-over-year -year funding, it will take a creative and multi-pronged approach to really get to the Smokies to be where it is a thriving network. Um, but I appreciate you having me here today to talk about as an organization. Um, so Friends of the Smokies is almost 30 years old. Um, we are the philanthropic partner of the park, and so every year the Park Service provides us with a list of programs they need funded, and then we work year-round to raise money um, to support those. Uh, that number has changed over the years, but right now it's averaging about $2 million a year. That's what we're working towards in 2021. Some of the projects that we fund, I won't go through the full list of 70 because that would take a very long time, um, but one of our flagship programs is the Trails Forever program. Um, that's kind of what you probably think of when you think of a park partner. They work on trail, trail projects. Um, Trails Forever is incredible. It's a national park service that funds a very highly skilled trail crew. Um, every year, oh, I'm missing a picture. They work to completely restore on a one to two year cycle one high use trail in the park. Although for the past couple of years, it's been very exciting to see that they have expanded beyond just the one full restoration. They're also doing smaller projects throughout the park. So more receiving attention, which is a good thing. Um, and you can see uh, from these before and afters, I'm missing one of my afters, that's okay though. Um, their work is beautiful because they work to really emulate that original CCC style. Not all national park trails were built by the CCC, but some in the Smokies were. Um, so there's real craftsmanship there. But also, if you look at this before picture and this after picture, the one on the right is a much safer trail. Uh, you're going to have fewer people rolling their ankles and falling. And so again, that, that work that we're funding has that ripple effect where it's not just that the, the trail is prettier, um, but it's also it's reducing incidences on the trails, which then takes the burden off of park staff who have to go in and get folks who are having trouble. So it's a program that has a lot of really good effects. There it is. Um, so of these 70 projects and programs, not all of them really have the glamour of trails. 
Um, we also fund things like vault toilets. These are the vault toilets in Catalucci, and it's not really exciting to go out to donors and be like, would you please give me some money for a vault toilet? But can you imagine if we didn't have those in the park, how problematic that would be? Um, so this is just to give you an idea that we are funding things that are very exciting and things that perhaps are not as photogenic. Um, but we are supporting things like research to fight woolly adelgid in the park that affects the balsams and the hemlocks. Um, the Smokies was one of the earliest in the National Park Service to take a really aggressive approach against the woolly adelgid. It's always going to be an uphill battle, um, but they are now successfully treating 35,000 trees on average on an annual basis. Um, Friends of the Smokies also supports the fisheries program, which is very robust in the Smokies. Um, we have such a strong fly fishing tradition here in western North Carolina, and those beautiful brook trout are something we want to see healthy populations of throughout the park. Um, and one of those restorations that's going on right now is on Little Catalucci Creek. And the elk. Um, so there are many elk, and I'm sure that we all know this. Um, but Friends of the Smokies funds the collars and the tagging uh, that goes on, as well as some of the volunteer programs in the park, where if you go in and you don't really know what you're supposed to do, they're going to educate visitors a little bit about not feeding their Cheetos or to the elk or taking selfies. Um, so that's a, a very regular program that Friends of the Smokies will always support. <laughs> And then search and rescue, I mean, we, we really can't reiterate how important this is to us um, as, a, as a nonprofit partner. Um, search and rescues have gone up. There are many, many each year. And we will never see a day, I don't believe, where there will be no search and rescue operations or needs for these teams. So in the meantime, we want to make sure that they have the best equipment possible, which is what we're funding. Um, we are also funding advanced trainings for the park's search and rescue program. Uh, and then more recently, we established uh, the preventative search and rescue program, which is a coordinated effort, mostly of volunteers, but led by park staff. And that's putting people at different trailheads, um, these volunteers at different trailheads, to try and educate visitors before they hit the trails about, do you have water? What shoes are you wearing? Do you understand how hard this trail is? And again, the idea is to bring down that need. And then, Friends of the Smokies, one of our core beliefs is in connecting children to the outdoors. Um, and Purchase Knob here in Haywood County really is the center for the Parks' Classrooms program. Um, thousands of children from East Tennessee and Western North Carolina uh, connect to the park each year. As we see, you can see here, we have a, a chimney. History lessons there at the bottom. Um, the bottom right there is one of my favorite photos that I took. That was at Purchase Knob, and I was hiking one day with one of our volunteers. And there was a middle school class there on a field trip. And um, it just so happened that the wildlife rangers had trapped a problematic bear that day. And it is the mentality of the whole park service there, all the staff, not just the education interpretive rangers, that this is an outdoor classroom. And so they immediately pulled in the children. And every single one of those kids got to have the experience of helping tag the bear. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen a bear that's been knocked out and tagged. but. You're not totally sure that it's asleep or that it's knocked out. There's a lot of grunting and, you know, they'd be like, come on, kids, stick your hand in this bear's mouth and let's pull a tooth out. And that's just that you just don't see everywhere. at every clan's experience that we're so fortunate to have here in the Smokies that all of them just really, really embrace this idea that this is an outdoor classroom. Um, and it really builds that generation after generation stewardship of the park. Um, so I'm very excited to share today one of Friends of the Smokies' newest and truly our biggest uh, initiative in our history. Um, this is our largest fundraising goal ever. So the Smokies, as we talked about earlier, has all of these historic structures, but they are not just old buildings. They, they provide the visual and the physical piece of continuing to st tell the stories of mountain families um, and the people who once called the park home. Uh, so we have launched what we're calling Forever Places, and we are working on building a $9 million endowment. Um, and once it is fully functional and fully fledged, we'll fund a trail crew, or I'm sorry, a preservation crew similar to the Trails Forever crew, highly skilled people who are dedicated to preserving the park's historic structures. Um, so we are partway there, and so the park has begun hiring, which is very exciting, and I am to share that one of the very first of the two projects that will fall under Forever Places is in Haywood County and it's Little Catalucci Baptist Church. 
Um, so when the Park Service came to Friends of the Smokies and asked us to begin this initiative, they always used a photo of Little Catalucci Baptist Church, which I don't have that photo, but they would run a straight line through the, uh, the church, and you could see that the whole church was like this. And so I think it makes sense that when they use that to share the need for this, that it is one of the first projects. So it'll be multiple years. Um, that's a really important piece of this community. And I know they have reunions every year out there. I went last year, and so I'm glad that this structure will remain intact. So Friends of the Smokies role. We're always growing friendships and trying to make friends everywhere we go. Uh, we leverage funds. We seek grants. We have our license program. Uh, we are a membership-based organization. Um, and we host events. So there are a variety of ways to get involved. Um, and so I do just want to conclude with, I think one of our most exciting things that's coming up this year, which is that our signature North Carolina fundraiser, Friends of the Smokies, will be at Catalucci Ranch right here down the road. Um, so I hope that I will see many of you in this room there um, because it will be very fun and it'll be on Saturday, July 23rd. So does anyone have any questions? See the uh, two hundred thirty-five million dollar maintenance backlog. Mm -hmm. That's that's has to be very concerning to your group. Uh, are you working to lobby Congress or anybody to try to let their purse strings down on getting some of these projects completed? So Friends of the Smokies doesn't engage in any lobbying activities, um, but we certainly encourage anyone who has friends in high places to address that backlog. The Great American Outdoors Act is certainly a good sign that there will be an injection of money into, into our public lands, um, not the, to the extent that it will address the backlog. I don't think the backlog is going anywhere fast. Um, but to, to answer your direct question, we don't engage in any lobbying. I guess that's why you're here in front of us today, in case we know somebody. <laughs> that might. You might say that. <laughs> well, I'd say thank you for your presentation, and, and I know it is our backyard national park, and we really appreciate it. And it, it's a great economic impact to our county. And mm -hmm. the elk uh, situation with with our county tourism and everything is just a. a uh, so thank you for all you do. Thank you. I have a quick question. First, First of all, thanks for your enthusiasm. It is a beautiful <laughs> place, and I can tell that you're passionate about it. Um, other places, Yellowstone, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, they, they're a fee system. They're, you know, you can, it's $25 a week or something. Sure. Why is that never, why is that never taking place here? You know? So when the park was established, um, there, there was legislation in Tennessee that there were not, there would not be tolls on certain ro roads that are on the Tennessee side of the park. Um, but then there is other legislation unrelated to the establishment park that says, well, if you can't have fees in certain areas, you can't have fees in any areas. Um, that being said, it is a common misunderstanding that there can be no fee to use the Smokies. That could come one day, um, and if it does, I, I would consider that a blessing um, because $235 million is so daunting. Um, but that, I guess, is the answer. That's the history behind why, there is, why there are fees at places like Yellowstone and most other big national parks. Sure. I know Brandon's been out west as well, and it's, you know, it's just, you're just accustomed when you go out there to pay in that, but yep. we don't do that here, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's true. Not that I'm encouraging that in any way, but <laughs> just curious why it didn't Sure. Work. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. I've oh. got a quick question. I know that, if I remember correctly, a lot of money is raised through the tags. Is that correct? Through the, the tags on the vehicles, the license Oh, plate. the tags, sorry, yeah, sorry. yes. Uh, yes, they are. Um, so when you get a Friends of the Smokies license plate, it's $30, and 20 of that comes back to Friends of the Smokies for projects in the park, um, specifically the North Carolina side of the park, uh, and then the other 10 goes to the North Carolina Scenic Byways Program. And if somebody wants one of those, they just request it when they go? Do they you have to be a member? You can go to your tag office. Yep, you can go to your tag office. Or you can go online um, and get it there. And then we have, if you go to bearplate.org, which is our website, it'll give you some more information about how to do it, too. I just thought that was good for the public to know. I'd heard mm -hmm. that in the past, and, and yes. I know I was shocked with, uh, by the amount of money that was raised by mm -hmm. buying those tags. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. Do, do you have uh, – I was wanting to – ask you too we uh, I had a surveyor friend of mine that was that grew up in the uh, 
His family's from Cataluchi, I mm -hmm. guess you could say. He, he didn't grow up there, but his family was from Cataluchi. And so he, he took it upon himself to go into Cataluchi and map all the cemeteries. I don't know if y'all have that map or not, but it was hand drawn. I mean, it was his map and it was, I guess, fairly accurate. He was a surveyor. And uh, if, if y'all, you can contact me if y'all need copies of that or something. He might have recorded it, I'm not sure. But I've just, I just noticed it here a while back. I noticed it in my files and I thought that's a neat uh, piece of history, if you will that he kind of created, and I don't know that he you know, get it out or anything, so. Mm -hmm. Thank but, you. Uh, yeah, but if, if that would help y'all, maybe even you could sell maps or something, I don't know. <laughs> but sure. it, you know, if people wanted to explore those cemeteries in the park, he, he did that and, and mapped them and everything. Shows where they are and what their names are and everything, so. Mm -hmm. but I thought that was pretty good of him to do that. Absolutely. Relatives there. I think there were Caldwells. His family, his mother was so. Yeah. It's a big name in, in yeah, Catalonia. Yeah. Yep, sure Caldwell is. and Palmer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Does anybody have anything else? Okay. Right. Well, thank, thank you, you for coming. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah, our next order of business, or the next item under agency reports, is the Nantahala and Pisgah Forest, the forest plan update. We have our Appalachian District Ranger Ben, Jen Benhart, and Pisgah. District Ranger Dave Casey. Welcome this morning. Appreciate y'all coming out. <laughs> morning, everybody. I must admit I'm, I'm jealous of a lot of that presentation on the Smokies. Um, <laughs> so uh, make sure I know how to operate that. But yeah, thanks for letting us come over this morning. My name's Dave Casey, District Ranger here on the Pisgah, south of y'all, and then Jen's the Ranger on the uh, Appalachian north of here. So just real quick, uh, y'all are probably familiar at least with the, the concept of the forest plan. We've been working on this plan for eight or nine years now. And uh, basically every national forest has to operate under a forest plan. Um, typically uh, they last 15 to 20 years, something like that. Um, and, and in general, a forest plan is something, it doesn't really decide to do specific activity on the ground in any specific place. It serves as more of a framework or overall guidance for how we manage the national forest. Um, so here we are. Uh, today we're just going to kind of catch up on uh, where we left off in 2020. Um, also review just some key elements and I'll, I'll try to make it quick. So in uh, 2020, um, in February, we rolled out the environmental impact statement. And uh, obviously, just ahead of COVID, so rolled out in order to receive comments on basically the direction we were going with things. And uh, that quickly led to virtual engagement to get feedback. We got a lot of responses on that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, overall, through the whole process, we received well over 10,000 comments um, on the forest plan. So the comments that came, came in after that draft EIS, uh, we've got a, a forest plan revision team that, that chewed through all those um, one by one. And uh, basically the result of that was this tweaked version of the forest plan uh, and then spent more time analyzing that. So we're at the point where we have this plan that has rolled out. Um, at this point in the process, we're not asking for comments anymore. Um, now we're going to the process where we're asking for those that commented on the process to review it, and if you have any concerns, um, to file an objection. And then there's a whole objection process to go through. Um, the picture on the left there, that's a picture of our current force plan that we're under. That was amended in 1994, so we've been working under it uh, for close to 30 years now. And obviously a lot has changed in the last 30 years. Um, obviously, we have visitation like the Smokies does, but visitation has boomed. Um, just a, a lot of things have changed, new forest threats um, and whatnot. So the reader's guide, this is this is very high level introduction to the forest plan today, but the reader's guide is something that if you want to dig to specific 
components of the forest plan, um, you can hop on our National Forest in North Carolina website and run through kind of digging down into specific topics that are listed on there. Uh, these are just some themes that you'll see repeated throughout the forest plan, you know, connecting folks to the ground, uh, sustaining healthy ecosystems, clean and abundant water, and partnerships. Um, connecting people to the ground, one new thing that we, we incorporated in this forest plan is the concept that, you know, basically the Nantahala and the Pisgah National Forest cover a million acres across 18 counties, and not all of those pieces of the forest are the same. They don't use the same, they're not the same cultures, communities around them. So the geographic areas was an attempt to treat those areas uh, that have unique cultures differently than other areas. Um, we're also definitely getting on attacking sustainable recreation, being very intentional about that, uh, you know, providing access to the public, and also just recognizing people in local, um, local communities and tourism and just the economic driver there. So sustaining healthy ecosystems, some of the things that came out in our analysis was that we have three underrepresented habitats that are common across the Nantahala and the Pisgah. One is young forest, uh, the other is open forest, ones where you've got widely spaced trees, more sun hitting the ground, and then also old growth. And so in response to that, we've basically included objectives in the forest plan to increase our prescribed burning, um, increase our maintenance of rare habitats, and uh, increase harvesting to create young forest, thinning to create open forest, and stuff like that. Also, invasive species. So clean and abundant water. Um, part of the plan was to identify priority watersheds. Uh, you know, some of that might be that they're a municipal water supply. Um, or they have rare species or threatened and endangered species, stuff like that. And it's really emphasizing providing aquatic organism passage through uh, road systems or under road systems. Um, also just basically focusing on stream restoration and uh, things like that. Also recognizing the role that roads play in uh, sediment transport to to waters and everything. So really emphasizing our road maintenance and being intentional about reducing sedimentation. And then partners. Um, we're extremely blessed, similar to the Smokies, with having just a very interested and engaged public around us. Um, Y'all are very aware of that. So one thing we've you know, definitely got tons of feedback in the forest plan process to, to guide that identifying stuff like stretch goals and folks coming alongside us and helping us and I'll get into that a little bit later um, so yeah so this is a an image here of the geographic area you'll see uh, the Haywood County is basically split between the North Slope geographic area here to our south and then also the Bald Mountains to the north. So this tiered objective thing, um, it's a new process like I mentioned, and tier one is basically, if budgets stay the same, our capacity stays the same, here's what we're committed to doing as far as treatments, recreation, all this stuff. The tier two objective is something that if we get additional capacity, through budgets, through partners, outside funding, whatever, then accomplishments will commensurately go up. So here's just another drilling down a little bit in uh, some wildlife habitat objectives. Young forest, intermediate thinning, open forest, and fire adapted communities. And on the right, you see an example of basically accomplishments that we're committing to to do um, through this forest plan. We're committing to doubling our creation of young forest in this forest plan and our tier two goes up from there. 
similar with thinning, pulling that, open forest creation, and uh, as well as prescribed fire a lot of times for uh, reducing fuel accumulation as well as wildlife habitat. So special areas are also considered in the forest plan, probably the most uh, contentious of those being wilderness. And we're required through the forest planning process to evaluate potential wilderness areas. Our role in wilderness areas is just that we recommend. We don't designate wilderness areas. We recommend to Congress. And so through this process, there were a lot that were evaluated and in the forest plan that just rolled out, basically there's 14 areas identified that total 49,000 acres. There are also new eligible wild and scenic rivers and other special interest areas. Also old growth, that was a, a thing that came up during the forest plan that was pretty contentious. So this forest plan basically identifies old growth areas where they are right now and doesn't provide for the ability to add them at project level decisions. And then also supporting communities, like I said before, just, you know, role in the local economy, whether it's outfitting and guiding on the national forest, just tourism, um, and also just committing to engaging governments moving forward, uh, having a very structured place where local county governments and cities can engage with a forest supervisor. And uh, y'all know more than anybody the effects of weather and tropical storm Fred, uh, similar to Francis and Ivan 18 years ago, but another thing that we focus on is creating a resilient infrastructure where we're, when those do come along, we're less impacted by them. So at this point, we've basically got uh, the, the documents were released last month in January, and now we're in this 60-day objection period, where if you commented before <clears throat> and you want to object, now you have 60 days to object. Those objections will be published after 60 days, and then at that point, there will be a resolution process to each objection. Um, and we're hoping to be operating under a new forest plan by this summer. And I think, do we have the map? Okay. And we've got a, a map also of, uh, thank you. Of course I didn't split out Haywood County. Okay, so you'll see on the map there, the uh, southern part of Haywood County um, is, is where, where I work on the Pisgah Ranger District. You can see there, this kind of splits out the management areas. So we manage the forest differently in different areas by management areas. So as y'all are very aware, you have about 25,000 acres of wilderness area right now, which is that dark gray with the shining rock and middle prong. Um, that obviously stays the same because that's congressionally designated. The uh, finger going to the north, that Lickstone Ridge area is in matrix. And so that is an area where, you know, timber harvesting and wildlife management in general is, is definitely uh, acceptable and, and encouraged. The kind of green areas are back country. And it just so happens that those green areas are overlapping inventory roadless areas. And that's another designation that we don't have any control over. So basically the back country areas are sitting on top of areas that, that we generally don't manage much at this point anyway. Um, we have some new eligible uh, wild and scenic rivers. And then we also have two um, recommended wilderness area additions to the south of, of Shining Rock Wilderness. Um, so basically in Haywood County, over 11,000 acres of potential wilderness area were evaluated, and this forest plan includes about 1,600 acres of recommended wilderness that's adding on to the south into the graveyard fields area. 
Um, and, and also, I'll just real quickly give an update on the Lickstone project that we're working on right now, and that about 9,000 acres in that finger. Uh, we're moving forward with a proposed action that'll include several hundred acres of commercial timber harvest, prescribed burning, um, wildlife management, and, uh, and stuff like that. And with that, I will hand it off to Jen Barnhart and let her give an update on the northern section. Uh, good morning. It's uh, nice to meet you. I have not met y'all. I've been here on the Appalachian Ranger District for a little over a year and a half, I'm located out of the Mars Hill uh, office. So the portion of Haywood County of the Appalachian Ranger District of the Pisgah National Forest is that northern section. Uh, you can see most of it is the light green. That's matrix. So as Dave had um, talked about, that is for where we're doing most of our active management uh, to benefit for healthy ecosystems and wildlife populations. And you'll see that uh, brighter green, that's a little portion of the backcountry. Again, that's the unroaded area. The blue portion and that very um, darker blue line, that's the Appalachian Trail. So that's our corridor there that we do uh, manage that area specifically around the National Scenic Trail. And then you have that little yellow blob area. That's interface. Um, so that's where we recognize where we have high concentrations of recreation areas. So for you all, think about that's Harmon Den area, the Cold Springs Road um, off of I-40, very popular um, areas for uh, horseback trail riding, um, hunting, uh, very active in, in that area. And so that's where you'll see that higher concentration um, access on the forest. And then we do have two smaller little areas, um, a, a special interest area, and we have an ecological interest area. So that's usually, if it's a special interest area, that's where there's the most exceptional ecological communities that, um, that we're looking at and that specific area um, that we're looking for a core area of conservation for. And then the ecological interest area is more of a concentration of biodiversity um, that would benefit with some active management. So for instance, up in that area, that's uh, where uh, elk habitat, um, as you guys are familiar, and we're not, we're very uh, budding up close to the Smokies just north of there. So beyond that, uh, that's that portion of Haywood County. I did want to interject more related to our timber sales. Um, so currently, uh, out of our 12-mile vegetation management uh, environmental assessment we was finalized by my predecessor, we are implementing an sale uh, this spring, hopefully, or summer. Um, that's called the Raven Sale, and that will be along that uh, Harmon Den Cold Springs area and up by Old Pigeon Roost. And it's been delayed. We're waiting for the I-40 construction to finish. Um, at this time, our timber sale purchaser is waiting to uh, wait till that ends with the large detour. Uh, beneficially, though, with that I-40 corridor, um, we would have been active as well as um, saying, you know, it's great that we're going to have the wildlife corridor at I-40. That's the whole point at that Harmon Den exit for um, elk crossing and other wildlife crossing. So that's going to be a great benefit from that, that portion items non-forest plan related. Um, just wanted to give a shout out to Haywood County Sheriff's Office. Uh, they do intersect with our patrol captain Jody Bandy. Um, anytime, a lot of times we have different things happening that's in, by private and national forest and oftentimes um, we'll rely and, and coordinate with the Sheriff's Office. So I did want to say that thank you on that part. And we also found out some really fun news. Uh, national Forest in North Carolina is going to be the national forest that Capitol Christmas tree for 2022 is coming off of. Typically, you see that all out west. Um, if you've seen anything, um, the huge tree that for the Capitol up in Washington, D.C., uh, I think the last time we had it come off North Carolina was in 1998. Uh, we're not sure exactly where it will come off of, of which forest yet, um, but regardless, all across North Carolina, we'll be working on engagement with the communities. Um, often we have to provide over 15,000 ornaments that come from community members, and so we'll be putting out more information because anyone that's interested, any local person in North Carolina, um, or if a county would choose to want to put a very special ornament um, representing Haywood County, that's something you guys could think about too. 
Thank you for your time. If you guys have any questions either related to the forest plan um, or any of our other updates, we'd be happy to, to answer any questions. Yeah, uh, Jen, we got we got an email from some of our soil and water folks, and uh, mm -hmm. I know all the commissioners asked uh, Crop Storm Fred back in August and, and what, we, what we saw from that. And uh, as a result of that, several meetings took place. I know the Secretary of Agriculture was here from North Carolina, and what our problem was, uh, there was a lot of people that actually witnessed, I had several residents tell me there was actually a wall of water came within seconds, and there was some pretty good intel. Probably a log jam broke loose coming, uh, I guess, off uh, Big East Fork, uh, the, the hiking entrance going up toward uh, Graveyard Fields area. But, uh, you know, we, we had a big discussion about uh, the hemlock, uh, Willie Algoli that's taking our hemlock trees down. And they're plugging up the waterways, and they're creating a, basically a public safety issue. Uh, we have loss of life. We have in infrastructure that's, that's damaged by events like that. And to prevent that, as far as making a plan moving forward for flood mitigation, you know, we need the ability to be able to forecast uh, the debris in the streams and make a plan to go, be able to go in and get that. Uh, before uh, another event like this occurs. And uh, that's a recommendation from our soil and water folks. And, and of course, I, I know Commissioner Rogers and I, we've kind of been boots on the ground in that whole scenario up there. We have family and friends and eyewitness accounts. And, and, I, and I know that uh, with the, the woolly algalid and the big hemlocks that grow beside the, 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 the uh, creek banks and the streams and the rivers, and any couple uh, we had some beavers somehow got reintroduced, and they've they've been ringing these tulip poplars and all these other big trees, that, sycamore trees that grow alongside the and uh, it's it's a problem, and uh, we we need somehow to figure out. And, and I know they've been in contact with you folks, and the wilderness designation is a big hang-up. But I get, you know my thing is when it comes to loss of life and public safety, there there should be some way that we could work something out to to enable that. Uh, what's your thoughts or, or your comments on that? Yeah, I will say it's, it's complex, um, especially up there at Big East Fork where you saw, you know, more water than even that bottomless arch can, could handle going under 276. So I, I don't know how to prepare for that or how to mitigate that. Just to be perfectly honest, we've been talking with our hydrologist about that same um, it's, I don't know, just to be perfectly honest, because you've got a significant amount of miles of streams up through the extremely remote, um, and there, there's certainly not an obvious solution to it. Is there sit down and talk about it? And Absolutely. Maybe try to come up with a solution. I know even maybe it was discussed going in and, and maybe with chainsaws and just cutting those things up into six, eight, ten foot lengths where they can float them Pass. down the river instead of the whole 70, 80, 100 foot long tree lap to, to create a big a hazard, you know, so yeah, that I, would be a simple solution. But. And, and I know on the other side of the mountain, I personally witnessed a lot of perfectly healthy trees with that much water coming through just, you know, the bank cabin right. and 120 foot poplars going down the creek, so yeah, it's, but definitely we could sit down and talk about that. Absolutely. You got, we got five months to try to come up with a situation where we can get, get in there and get that cleaned out. Maybe. Well, before the next round, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but I would actually love to sit down and talk through that. I hope we can come to some solution on that because mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of one of those situations where it's very obvious to, anybody that's uh, you know paying attention that needs to something needs to be addressed about that yeah sorry I don't have a better answer than that <laughs> I have a quick question on those timber sales do you just bid that off to loggers is that how that works yeah we we bid out the timber sale or we go through a stewardship agreement but on a lot of our timber sales we would bid it out and then and then they would bid and come in there and then we oversee the timber sale and then 
the receipts from that timber sale go into basically doing additional work around there to, to better the area. Does anybody have any other questions? Thank you. Thank you all for coming out today. Our next uh, item is the child, the county child protection team annual report, which uh, is be given by our HHSA social work division director and CCPT chair Gayla Jones. Welcome, Gayla. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, first off, before I go over the annual report, I just want to say that I began my career at Haywood County Health and Human Services. It was Department of Social Services then, um, over 21 years. And I was hired as a social worker, and I've been there ever since. And um, take my duty as the social work director very seriously. And um, I lead a great group of social workers each and every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, to help protect the juveniles and disabled adults of this community. Um, and we do that within the guidelines of North Carolina General Statute as well as North Carolina Division of Health and Human Services Policy. So I did just want to say that. Okay, for our... We call it CCPT, but it's Community Child Protection Team. Um, we follow General Statute 7B 1406 as a team. We meet quarterly, and we've been doing that virtually uh, within 2021 due to COVID. Um, it's a group of community partners, and we meet to discuss active child welfare cases. Um, as well as to review some uh, fatality reviews that may be uh, suspect of abuse or neglect. So we met February, May, August, and November in 2021. And I just summarized, uh, we reviewed four active child welfare cases. Um, in May, we had a training, um, and it was the effects of exposure to I mean, on your children, and that was um, presented by Heather Zanzig with Children's Developmental Services Agency. So the overall impression with those meetings and those cases that we reviewed, um, I just tried to summarize just um, basically that, you know, our community used to be affected by mental health and substance abuse, as we've heard this morning, um, that COVID has changed the way that our children have received services um, in schools, in the community, um, therapy changed um, due to COVID. Um, so there's been televisits, um, you know, but that's not, that's not the same. Uh, and we continue to have a need for those mental health providers for our children um, in the community. Um, that's what I see the most right now. Um, we need providers to be able to provide those services to our children. So I think that is the gist of my report. If you got questions, I would be more than willing to answer those. I don't have any questions about your report, but I. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I would like to provide you an opportunity to kind of respond to the, the folks that came in this uh, earlier this morning and have now left. Um, and, and just give the public an idea of, uh, usually the Department of Social Services is, is presented with the telephone call uh, and a call and a report. So if you could just, I mean, I, I know you're not prepared <laughs> to do this, but if you have time, it, if you could just explain to us and to the public once you get that call, what is your responsibility as part of as, as far as the Department of Social Services go, goes, and and when you do investigate, how you make the determinations of what to do? Sure, I can do that. Um, like you said, we usually typically receive CPS reports uh, through a phone call. 
Um, anybody can come in person as well. Sometimes we get letters in the mail. Um, so we take all of those reports and um, by an intake social worker or any, any social worker within the agency. And we have state guidelines that we have to follow when we screen those reports. Um, it has to meet that criteria in our policy and within the law. Um, once those are screened, they can be screened out. Um, we have a couple social workers that can pr provide some outreach services if they don't meet the criteria, but we feel like we could make some uh, recommendations or referrals for those families. Um, if it is screened in, we have a response time. Um, it can be an immediate response. It can be a 72-hour response that we have to get out and meet with those families to investigate those allegations, um, to ensure the safety of those children in those homes. Um, we look at domestic violence, we look at substance abuse, we look at mental health, um, and, and it, there can be reports that have all, all of those components. So our social workers go out, they assess that safety, they create safety plans. Um, we also assess, can these children remain in the home safely? Um, you know, can there be family members that can act as a, a safety resource in those cases while we investigate and, and gather all of the facts in that? Um, we typically have 45 days to make those case decisions. Um, sometimes we have to go over. Um, if um, need to do a child medical exam, um, get, gather more evidence. Um, so we take these reports very seriously and um, evaluate the allegations um, while following policy, um, protecting parents' um, rights throughout all of this. Um, I think within some of the, the issues in Cherokee County, the biological parents' parental rights were not um, protected and were not looked after, so that is a result of, of some of that um, problem in Cherokee County. And so we have to take in all of those factors. Um, we do that, we make a case decision, and then um, we decide whether we need to be involved in that family's life a little bit more to help make referrals, help them get services, um, change some of those patterns that have created that un, um, unsafe environment. Um, if we can't do that with in-home services, then we do um, petition the court um, and ask for a judge to look at that case. Uh, we can do that on a non-secure basis, which there is an immediate risk and we cannot leave that child in the home. Um, so do that, um, petitioning the court and putting that case in front of a, a judge and them determining whether that child needs to come into our custody um, or can remain safely with uh, parents or relatives during our work with the family. So, so when you get a call or letter, you have to in, at least make some investigation into every single call or letter. We have to look at that report. We have to screen that. We have to go through. We have policy. It's called a decision-making tree. And we look at all of those allegations, and, and it, policy guides us on um, whether that report is acceptable or if it doesn't meet the criteria um, for policy and, and state general statutes. So yes, we do take a thorough look at the, every report that we receive. Can you give us an idea about how many reports you get a day, a week, or a year, or, or just just some general idea? I know that uh, that's putting you on the spot as well. This is not well. Part yeah, of your don't quote me on the exact number. Um, but looking month to month, it varies. Um, a lot of times we may have 70 or 80 reports a month. Um, we may accept 40, 45 of those. So um, I would say that's a, a good average of what we see each month. Well, I, I appreciate what you do. I know it's a very Thank difficult you. job, and, and, you, and you're stretched very thin. And, and I, I, anybody who has to deal with a parent child, um, whether that's the school system or whether it's going to investigate an alleged uh, incident with the child, I, I feel for them. Um, and it, it's a difficult job, and I appreciate it. Thank you. That's one of the hardest jobs in the county, probably, is, is DSS social workers, because you, you have to, you have to call, and
in the statutes. And um, I know a lot of us get frustrated with that, but that's just what the law, it's, we're a nation of laws and that's what we gotta go by. But you guys have to make decisions every day on a multitude of cases. Uh, I do appreciate the work you do. I know you the best you can. And, um, you know, we're, we're not Cherokee County, but, you know, I'm not saying things might fall through the cracks. You never know what somebody's going to do at any moment. And, uh, but I appreciate the work. And I understand how hard it is. And all these cases are so different, you know, you, and you don't know all the facts behind them and everything like that. But, uh, but, you know, just y'all, I appreciate all the work, the work that y'all do. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to point this out about that Cherokee County case. I mean, just as Gail had indicated, the Cherokee County case had to deal with the lawsuit against the Cherokee County Social Services Department because they were not protecting the rights of parents. Uh, and so that's what the suit was about. Ms. Pitt maybe referred to it like social services weren't doing their job investigating cases, but um, they just weren't protecting the rights of the parents. And so, you know, these are these folks are representing grandparents because grandparents don't have many rights, if you want to know the truth, and, and they shouldn't because the parents are supposed to be responsible for them. So, you know, the thing is, it, it's very distinguishable, that situation from what county is attempting to do or her or allegations are that Haywood County doesn't do anything to protect these children, though they haven't in the past. And they do. They're not being sued like um, the Cherokee County are being sued for not doing their job. I mean, they, they do their job, and I'm, I'm proud of, of the Department of Social Services. I had plenty of fights with them back in the day. <laughs> Lost most all of them because, like I said, the parents weren't doing what they're supposed to do. But at any rate, thank you. So I, I want to say that I know our intention is no one would ever want a child to be, to be lost to any sort of violent act. And I think the grandparents and myself and probably the Board of Commissioners and certainly all of you and the, the folks that work there would, want, would never want that to happen. But you said something earlier. You said we need providers to provide therapy to our children. Is that a funding issue or is it a staffing issue? I think right now it's a staffing issue. Um, I think uh, within Haywood County, I think the mental health system overall um, has a lot of deficiencies. Um, however, I feel like um, in Haywood County, we need those providers that can offer that, not only to children, especially the children that we're serving, um, but also um, the parents and adults as well. And, and you mentioned that COVID has had such a, well, it's had such a direct impact on everything we do. Mm -hmm. from something as simple as buying groceries to therapy for, for young people that don't have a voice. So certainly it would make sense that it would impact that. And I understand that you have to operate under general statute and that's well beyond our scope of authority for sure. But it is, um, I, what I said earlier about them speaking, I admire anybody, I say this a lot, that will come and speak at public meetings and it is the saddest of situations to lose a child to something like that. So um, just wanna make sure that we're bringing attention where attention needs to be brought. And so if we need funding or staffing, we want to, you know, to the best of our ability to be able to support that, or at least I think that would be the case for all of us. Absolutely. I'd also like to say thank you for the job you do. And just the title of your report and the title of the report that's following yours, uh, you know, we're trying. As a county, we do do our best. appreciate the, the good job you all do, and, and I'm the best. And, it is tragic when something slips through the cracks, but uh, you, you know, you're on it. We're trying our best, and I uh, appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate that. I guess I'll have to add to all that as well. Uh, Gail, I appreciate you, what you do. I've told you that many times. As I said, I'm the commissioner representative on the HHS board, so I hear a lot of these reports all the time, and, and when I come in, just as I did the library, uh, I had heard of a lot of public comment about DSS at the time, mm -hmm. and, and I come in with my eyes wide open, and uh, before as well, I have realized uh, in the years since I've been elected that what, what HHS does, the people that's involved there, I go up late in the evening, you know, sometimes I'm there at 7 o'clock when we had our meetings, and I see folks coming in and out, social workers coming in and out working late. Uh, coming in to go do something. I see a lot of dedication. And, and as I said earlier, I think for the most part, 
we have an awesome uh, HHS uh, department as a whole. Everybody gives 150% if that's possible. And, and I want to say publicly I appreciate them. I appreciate all of our folks at uh, HHS and what they do, especially the social workers. My daughter had a good friend that had come to work there, and uh, uh, she was telling us how difficult the job actually was. You know, we, we forget that, but as Kirk pointed out, when you're dealing with people's kids, uh, it's like law enforcement or uh, any anything else that would go to a family or a home where kids are involved, people's upset, emotions are high, and it's a difficult situation. So, again, I think... When you say uh, DSS is sorry or HHS is sorry, you got to be careful because that's categorizing uh, anybody and, and you can't do that because we may have one or two that may have not done their job or something may have fell through the cracks and we need to fix that, don't get me wrong. But I think for the most part we've got some great people up there, uh, great leaders and directors and we appreciate you and what you do. And uh, we have you back, especially if you're doing the job and doing it correctly. Uh, I think the question that or concern that I have that has come up with all this is the rights of the grandparents, even though the parents are the ones that have the rights. You know, maybe there's some things that we do need to look at. But if I understand correctly, if you take a child home, uh, the grandparents can be decided uh, as one of the, the folks that can take those children in. Is that correct? Certainly. Um, policy and general statute require us to look at relatives. Um, we try to do the least restrictive means um, possible when we're dealing with children and removing them from homes. So we explore every family option um, available um, first before we look at assuming custody. Um, however, the parents have to agree to that um, and we have to do the same checks on on grandparents or relatives that we would do on anybody else um, to make sure that they're safe and appropriate. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. I thought that was the case. I do know that uh, as in some of the situations that were raised uh, this morning, if a grandparent knows that the, the, the kids, their kids, which is the parents, are doing something wrong or illegal, I know it is a difficult process for them. And maybe that's something we need to look at as the leaders and trying to fix or resolve that. But again, I know you guys have to work in the boundary of the laws just as we all do. And uh, sometimes it may not be easy or fun, but uh, it's just that's just the way it is and we have to do that. But again, thank you for what you do and for all the folks at HHS that, that does their job and does it correctly. And again, if there's somebody that's not, we will address it. But thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And just one more question. I was just thinking, Gayla, that uh, I've been a commissioner for a good while, and I've gotten calls from parents because you, you guys did take the kids away and complaints, but I don't, we, don't, we don't know the facts, and we can't know the facts, you know, and the reason. So you're kind of danged if you do and danged if you don't, you know, and, and something happens. So, uh, and that shows you how hard it is. But I've, I remember early on, I... I would have people call me and say, they took, you know, it's like y'all were being heavy handed or something. So you guys mm -hmm. got to balance all that out. And it's just tough. It's just a very tough job, you know, mm -hmm. so, but thank you. all. Thank you guys for your support. Okay, uh, our next item is the Ch Child Fatality Prevention Team Annual Report. And given that will be our Public Health and Services Division Director and uh, our FTPT Chair, Sarah Henderson. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks for coming out today. Good morning. Hey. I'm here to talk about something other than COVID. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are directed by the same general statute that Gala's team is. Our child vitality team was established in 1995. And um, usually on the same day just following Gala's meeting, um, a lot of same people attend both or, or you know, appointed to both teams. So um, one thing that's important to remember about both of those teams is that it's not just those of us that are submerged in it constantly. There are other outside community partners involved in both teams, so there's different perspectives. Um, so the, the role of the child fatality team um, to review each um, child death from birth to age 18 
our county. Um, we did play a little bit of catch up this year because of COVID. Um, we met twice in 2020. Uh, February was the suicide prevention training. And then we met in October after I came on board to kind of catch up from those cases. So we had three cases to review then. For 2021, we reviewed seven cases. Um, three of those were due to perinatal complications. So complications um, during the end of pregnancy or just after delivery. Um, Three of them were medical conditions that were congenital that were out of our control, and then one of those was a suicide review. Um, all of our findings and recommendations at those meetings are then forwarded and submitted to the North Carolina child, um, State Child Fatality Team um, to see if there's further action after that that, that we need to follow up on. Um, I'm trying to think. That's just a basic overview of what we do. Are there questions? Have any questions for Sarah? So once you review that information about the cause of those fatalities, what happens to that information? It kind of depends on what the cause of death was. Um, if it's something that's congenital, there's not a whole lot that we can do from there. Um, suicide prevention and mental health is at the top of our list. Uh, most of you know I have a very personal connection to that, and it's something that we continue to see, not just in adolescents, but in adults too. Um, so it's something that we need to be talking about, and we've addressed that on both teams moving forward, that um, we need to have a louder voice in that. Certainly, I feel the need to have a louder voice. Um, so then it goes on to training um, or community outreach. You know, what can we do? Who can we talk to? Where can we make our voices heard? Where can we educate? That sort of thing. So it just kind of depends on what the cause of death is. I noticed you sent some folks to training on safe sleep and melatonin uh, mm -hmm. in relation to the uh, state child's f fatality prevention team. Uh, I noticed you call that one substance out, melatonin. Has is, is that been linked to child fatalities or just a sleep aid? Just a sleep aid. Safe sleep is something that we always talk about. Um, you know, we have a, a lot of people in our communities who are, are underserved, and, and we have made it our mission at HHS to try to provide pack and plays and that sort of thing to get babies out of, out of beds and, and to avoid that co-sleeping because we do run into issues and, and fatalities associated with, with, um, with co-sleeping. But we realize, you know, when you've, you've got a population that's underserved that is, you know, looking for heat resources and that sort of thing and keeping everybody warm or they don't have the money for a crib. So um, we've had several years, um, both, you know, on, on both sides of the HHS building that have been able to, to push out a lot of pack and plays into, into our community to avoid those, those co-sleeping instances. Thank you. Any other questions for Sarah? All right. Thank you, Sarah. Appreciate you coming out. Our next item under agency reports is uh, emergency management services staffing update. We have our emergency management services director, Travis Dawson, here this morning. Welcome, Travis. <laughs> Speaking of COVID, you're here. <laughs> Good morning, commissioners. Um, what I've got for you today here is uh, is an informational presentation uh, put together, I'm talking about saving our lifesavers. Um, looks like we got one screen up and going here. Um, go through a, a PowerPoint with you, uh, highlighting uh, some of uh, some of the issues we're facing now, have faced in the past and issues that are going to be present with us going into the future in emergency medicine out in the field. Uh, the first cover picture there is, uh, is a good picture for uh, what most of my staff looks like right now. They're tired, they're exhausted. Uh, they've been working two years of COVID now uh, in, in a very uh, fast growing call volume at this point. Uh, next slide uh, is talking about definitions uh, related to this presentation. Uh, talking about different shifts, uh, 2448 schedules, 2472 schedules, the 12 hours, and then the difference between an ALS ambulance and a BLS ambulance, uh, as well as quick response vehicle. Um, to hit some high points here, the 2448 shift is 24 hours on the job working an ambulance, uh, then they get a total of 48 hours off, 
and then that cycle repeats. Uh, a 24-72 schedule is 24 hours on, uh, 72 hours off the job, and then repeats again. Next slide is uh, kind of the, uh, the shift history uh, for Haywood County EMS. Uh, back in 1993, Haywood County EMS took over as a primary um, ALS ambulance provider, uh, 911 provider for Haywood County from the rescue squad. Uh, they had been the primary provider up till that point. Um, in 93, the county stepped in and took over due to call volume and the inability for them to be able to run that system with volunteers. Uh, in 93, we started out with two ambulances working 24 shifts. Uh, and a daytime truck, uh, as you'll see in the slide, progressing along. And between 94 and 2008, uh, there were five ambulances working 24-72, uh, one day shift, and then a uh, supervisor was added, a quick response vehicle during those years. Um, then we come to 2008. Uh, 2008 was, everybody remembers, a, a financial crisis that everybody experienced. In 2008, Haywood County also was experiencing uh, growing call volume, and with that, the need to add another ambulance. Uh, that ambulance uh, that was added in 08 is the, Beth the ambulance that's stationed in Bethel near Silver Silverbluff. That was the sixth ambulance, ambulance at that point. In order to be able to uh, add that truck in 08, um, part of our shifts were divided up. Uh, that's when 2448 scheduling came around. Uh, it takes less people to run a 2448 shift. So when we took all those trucks that were working 472 and flipped four of them to work in the 20, 2448, we gained enough staff to add another ambulance without actually adding full-time employees. Um, that's kind of a good point in time that I'd like to go back to because that's where, where I would like to eventually get us uh, later on this presentation. 2015 to present, uh, currently we've got three ambulances on 48s, three ambulances on 72s, uh, two uh, daytime trucks, and still the, the supervisor and the QRV. Your next slide is looking at calls for service and call volume. As you'll see, we've been on a steady growth um, 2018 to 19. That big bump was when we had adolescent transports. Um, 2020, uh, you will notice a slight decrease in numbers, and that is folks that were scared to want to go to the hospital for COVID. And we did see a call, call volume drop in 2020. However, in 21, we picked up where we left off and, and continuing to average between a 10 and 15% growth year to year when you look at the long term. Uh, looking where we're at and where we're maybe projecting 2022 to go, uh, looking back at data uh, for January of 19, 20, 21, and 22, you can see the call volume growth there. Um, we've added um, about another 10% on to, uh, to the Januaries of previous years. Um, Factors driving this, overall population growth, an aging population, and an increase in tourism, I think we've all seen over the past couple of years, uh, whether it be due to COVID or just people wanting to come see the mountains or wanting to come move and live here. Um, but we all have a, a very aging population, uh, both locals and, as well as folks coming here to retire. <clears throat> Next slide is going to be talking about uh, what our neighbors are doing and shift scheduling. Um, the majority of folks, our neighbors, looking at Cherokee Tribal, Harris, Henderson, Buncombe, McDowell, Macon, and Madison. Most 2448 shift, a 2472 shift, uh, 12 hour shifts, or there are some outliers um, that uh, work modified DuPont shifts, uh, which are basically 24 on off for 12, back on for 12, and rotates around. It's equivalent to the same amount of hours as a 24-72 shift. Uh, then Macon County has a 48 on and a 144 off. That's the Highlands truck, which is in a very remote area that doesn't actually get a lot of calls. 
Moving on to the next slide, and it's one I'd like to really look at. Um, this breaks it down uh, for what folks actually spend at work time-wise over a 30-year career. This isn't extra shifts. This is based on what we require you to be at work for without working your extras. And the blue line is a Monday through Friday 8 to 5 schedule. Most typical Americans are working that schedule. Uh, that's 20, 80 a year that you spend at work. And when you break that down into a 30-year career, 7.12 excuse me, 7.12 years at work uh, over your 30-year career. That's um, that's the basis of, of this slide here. Then I'd like to jump over uh, to the 2448 shift work that uh, half of our service works. Uh, they, over a 30-year career, the same 30 years that the Monday through Friday folks work, they spend 10.15 years at work. Uh, that's a substantial increase, uh, especially with the stressors and the job that these folks are doing. Um, the slide next in the middle is 2472 shifts, which is what half of our trucks are working, and what our whole service used to back before 2008, and that gets us to 7.89 years at work uh, over your 30-year career. So it gets them closer back to what that normal Monday through Friday employee actually works. Before I move on, does anybody have any questions about this particular slide or these figures? Why have you, why have we chosen to have the 2448? I mean, I know, I know over the years a lot of this is based on what the employees wanted as well. Uh, correct, and I think I've got that in another slide somewhere, but we'll dive into that a little bit. Uh, in 08, when the, uh, when the uh, economy had its, uh, has, had its hiccup. Um, we needed to add another ambulance instead of adding another 72 ambulance, which would have cost more employees. We split it up and, uh, and got a, another truck out of it without working any additional or acquiring additional full-time employees. Over the years, uh, we've just really never looked at, hey, can we swap back? What do people really want to okay. do? And later on in the presentation, I'll actually get into a survey where we sample data from employees to see what their wishes would be. Okay. Thank you. Moving on here to the next slide. Uh, talks about that survey. Um, surveyed all full-time uh, staff. 76% of those staff re responded. Um, 81% uh, requested some sort of variation to the 2472 schedule. 17% wanted to stay on the 2448 schedule. And then 2% wanted to stay on a shift schedule. And again, that was 76% 76 uh, that actually responded. And I will also tell you that another data set that we gained from that was asking folks what shift they're currently on. And of the data of the respondents that responded, 40% were still on some variation of 2472 currently, and 42% of those that responded currently worked a 2448 schedule. Travis, how many staff you said 76% of the staff responded. How many staff was that? What's the actual number? Uh, it was 52 or 55 surveyed. Okay. And uh, I think I had 48 uh, respond back. Okay. Thanks Thank how you. that math. It was somewhere real close to that. Okay. Moving on to the next side, slide, talking about preserving our lifesavers. Um, looking at the comprehensive assessment of EMS that completed back in 2019 uh, for our service, uh, one of the items in his uh, recommendations section of his uh, assessment highlighted uh, correcting and fixing uh, the shift schedules uh, that our service works. Um, 
EMS staff are ultimately and intimately involved in somebody's worst day almost on a daily basis. Uh, you think about it, uh, our crews are going out there and dealing with people's lives similar to what uh, Health and Human Services deals with, uh, interacting with people on the worst day of their life, family member's death, traumatic event, and those my people and, and DSS folks are doing that on a daily basis, multiple times a day, which wears on our folks, uh, which is why I want to look at this and bring it to your attention. Some of the other increased risk factors that EMS employees potentially are subjected to, sleep disorders, PTSD, diabetes, muscular skeletal injuries, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, poor physical health, as well as risk of suicide. Moving on to the next side, slide is, um, is a graphic that was pulled from uh, the Journal of Emergency Medical Services uh, from 2015. Um, looking at suicide awareness. Um, as you'll see in the graphic, um, the data sampled, uh, looking at CDC national average among uh, average citizens, uh, suicide contemplation, 3.7% uh, responded that they had had some sort of suicidal contemplation. Uh, when you look at uh, EMS providers that were surveyed, 37 responded. Um, that they had some sort of suicide contemplation. Suicide attempts, same data sample, um, half a percent for the national average, and then looking at EMS provider data, 6.6%. That's 13 times greater as far as suicide attempts among EMS providers. Speaking to uh, some of our local experts that have been working on this problem, uh, Rick Baker with Responder Support Services, who we utilize here in the county. Um, over the past 10 years, we've had 25 suicides among first responders just in Western North Carolina alone. That's 25 in 10 years. I can tell you personally that I don't have three classmates that I went to paramedic school as a result of suicide. Um, that's a substantial number. A good thing that's come out of this is the attention that it's drawn and the fact that we need to act. Um, Rick Baker, as well as the Western North Carolina Peer Support Group, as well as the Fast Track Program, uh, where it gets folks that are in need of help and support, the help and support without the red flags attached to it, and gets them into hospitals and to see clinicians quicker and easier without the stigmatism because if I say I have a problem, I go to the hospital and I sit in the ER and I wear paper scrubs, one of my peers is walking by looking at me and that creates a substantial stigmatism. And that's some of the good things that have come out of somebody paying attention to this data that we're looking at. Um, so there is awareness there and it's, uh, it's something that we're looking at but we need to do more to be able to get in front of it. Moving to the next slide here, uh, how can we save our lifesavers? Uh, reduce burnout by modifying the shift schedule. Um, going back to that 2472 across the board and get rid of our 2448 shifts uh, that have our folks working an absorbent amount of, uh, of overtime. Some supporting mental and physical health, expanding responder support services as well as physical health support measures mental health and wellness training, incorporating in, into a monthly training day, and to follow mental health specialist suggestions with guidance for improvements in the future. Uh, and the other big one is uh, being able to be proactive and identify and implement an innovative new strategies for our folks going forward. Um, 
I can tell you from working in the field, trying to hire providers, and talking to our providers and, and neighboring administrators and, and really across the nation, um, you know, you, we keep talking about this healthcare shortage, only a, an EMS provider shortage, um, and we're feeling it here. Uh, we're still getting applying uh, new hires, but they're not the experienced providers that we used to see in the past. Uh, these folks that we're seeing here lately don't have any experience except maybe going to school for it when they show up here, which is different from what we used to see in the past. Those folks came through a fire department. They were running medical calls with the fire department and had some feel for what it was like to be involved in somebody's worst day of their life. Uh, we're not seeing that now, and that's, that's an alarming issue for me, uh, getting experienced providers on the ground taking care of our citizens. As a result for that, folks come, they work for a little while, they see some stuff and decide it's not the field for them and they move on. So we're losing that, uh, that longevity out of that employee. Next slide is uh, talking about what it's gonna take. Um, what it's gonna take to get us back to where we were pre-2008 when we flipped and, and sold our souls to 2448s to, to put another ambulance on. It's going to take seven full-time employees. Uh, that's going to consist of a shift supervisor, an assistant shift supervisor, and five paramedics. Uh, you can see the cost line there. Um, it's $100,000 in uh, additional salaries for those seven. And the reason that number is so low is because we're saving some overtime off of that 3,000 hour mark that our folks are scheduled for. So that's what the difference comes out to be as far as the salaries go. Then we're looking at the benefit package of 235. So per physical year, roughly $335,000. Um, and that incorporates the savings of reduction in overtime. Um, if we manage to do this at the end of this physical year, it's 83,750 per quarter. And basically the reason I'm here talking to you about it today is to, is to plant a seed, see where we wanna go. Um, what's got us to this opportunity is the, uh, the, comp the compensation study that was completed and implemented uh, at the end of last year. Um, got our staff a bump in pay that they had been uh, patiently awaiting. Um, and this up, I can tell folks that were working that 2448 schedule that if I can get you working less, you will be making the same amount of money you were before we had the pay increase. So those folks that have income set or had income set on what they were making before the pay study was implemented, they'll still be at that level, but they'll be working 800 hours less scheduled a year. Um, aspect to that is, well, we still wants to pick up extra shifts. I promise you we have extra shifts. I fill around 25 to 30 of them every week, depending on short-term, long-term outages. And now with COVID being factored in, we there's plenty of holes to fill if somebody wants to pick up overtime. I'm just looking at improving our employees' overall health, both mental and physical. Um, that gets us into the next slide. Anticipated benefits, better patient care, um, better rested and ready to make that life-saving decision uh, going down the road in the middle of the night. Uh, better recruitment and retention, um, attract uh, seasoned providers from other agencies that are tired of working the 2448 schedule and getting burnt out. Higher level of training and camaraderie, uh, dedicating a training day every month, which increases the quality of service. Better so social support system, a better work-life balance. Um, we'll also say that as even before COVID, Training within our system was hard because we had 
people on 2448s. We had people on 2472s. The shift supervisors work a 2448 schedule. And then you have 12 hours, 12 hour shift people. I'm trying to get all those people together at one time and actually do successful training together as a group is pretty much near impossible once you have all those, all those mixes and factors and variables in there. Um, the downfall normally looking at a 2472 schedule is on during one week of every, of every month, uh, that employee is only going to work 24 hours. So you have a short week, one pay period, short week, one pay period every month. Um, and part of the solution that, uh, that I'm looking at implementing is actually taking their short week when they only get that one shift and actually introducing an eight hour, 10 hour training day into that week so they get time added back to that short week and it also allows for them to come together to do training together in person and, and hopefully something that makes a difference. Um, because we've lost that and we lost it back in 2008 when then we had the big division between the two different shifts. So those are things that uh, I think we need to look at in the near future. There's obviously more stuff that we're going to have to look at and, uh, and address as time goes on. I feel like EMS is going to become a uh, very evolving, uh, it's, going be, it's going to become very evolving in the next five years. Uh, there's legislation coming down, uh, changes coming down, educational requirements. Currently, uh, you can be a paramedic on a, on a certificate, but in the near future, uh, the state is looking at implementing it, requiring a degree. So those are gonna be other educational challenges for us to get around and work around in the future. And then the last slide, um, if it's predictable, then it's preventable, and that's by Gordon Graham. Wanna come across, it was fitting for this presentation, so. Anybody have any questions? Travis, do you think we can get seven new full-time employees in today's environment? I think so. Okay. Um, I've got some part-timers that are interested in working full-time. We normally hire out of our part-time pool into the full-time side just so we know what we're getting and they know what they're getting into. Um, it might take us a little bit longer, and I would be interested to see how many neighboring agencies uh, have some staff that might be interested in coming to Haywood County if we were able to, to put something in place like this? Uh, I have a couple questions. So today I, we've heard from a lot of people that do jobs that I'm definitely not qualified for. There's a reason I sell insurance. So I really appreciate what y'all do. And I don't say that lightly. Um, on your your thoughts about seven full-time employees, one shift supervisor, an assistant supervisor, and five paramedics. Are those supervisors on trucks as well? The full-time supervisor is in a QRV. The assistant supervisor is on a truck as a part of a two-person ambulance, and then he backfills if the supervisor is out. Um, we have, I know you talked about filling these positions, and we, you know, we did have the employment study that we implemented. Do we have, do we have openings now? I have two openings right now, and I'm kind of hanging out, trying to see if we're going to hire two or a bunch more. Um, it's two or seven. <laughs> yeah, okay. but basically it's either going to be two or nine is what I'm sitting on right now. Well, I, we, we've talked about this a lot that our benefits packages are are very attractive, so hopefully, like you said, we could pull from some other agencies. I know in the past, even in the time that I've been here, agency has, agencies have pulled from us, so it would be nice for it to come the other direction. Yep. Um, rest is certainly very important. It's one of the things that you mentioned. It's very important, obviously, for all of us, but for the folks that do your job, I want, if I need your services, I want the guy or the gal that's coming on fully rested. Correct. That's who I want to respond to me, so. Correct. That's, that's a big part of it. Uh, I can personally tell you that if I, would have, if I would have remained on a truck working a 2448 schedule, I 
there was no way I'd make it a 30-year career between physical and, and mental strains. I don't see how some of our folks make it there, and, and honestly, very few of them actually do, if you go back and look at our numbers. Um, it is very important to have rest. Um, you work a 24-48 or a 24-48 schedule. You run solid for 24 hours. You come home. You do life. You maybe get rest. Maybe don't get rest. And you've got a day to actually do what you've got to do to keep your family life going. And then you're back on the cycle again. So it uh, it can wear on you in that kind of shift, and especially the busy system. Our system is becoming a busy system at this point. Uh, 2008, working a 48 wasn't quite so bad, but uh, you know we're running eight or nine thousand calls back then, and we're knocking on 14,000 right now. So it's a change of time and, and getting busier. Our demographics have changed somewhat too, so that definitely is impactful. I mean, anybody can need your services, but definitely as we get older, we tend to need them more. My only concern about it is folks have set up their household budgets. You know they're operating on what they're 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 used to making what they're used to making and i would never want that to be a negative impact so. yeah and that's uh, when i first discussed this with staff uh, before the pay study came out i told them that i wasn't going to be interested in it if i was going to take money out of their pocket from what they were currently making pre-pay study uh, I, the other side of that is i don't want to delay looking at this because I know my people and there will be camper and boat payments with this extra money that they've been getting for the past couple months. And uh, I've tried to remind them that we're looking at this and not to commit to buying a camper and a boat and have an extra payment with the extra money that they've gotten since the pay study. No doubt we need to do something. Uh, as you suggested, uh, don't like seeing the burnout. Uh, I know the stress, and uh, as you said, you, when you folks arrive on the scene, you're going to be the worst day, and uh, we realize that. So definitely want to take care of those people. Uh, I, I am curious, uh, Travis, two, only 2% 2 want to do the 12-hour day shifts. Do you know why that is versus doing the 24-72? Well, during the poll that we did there, that 2% are folks that are already working those 12 hour shifts. So they've already got their life set around working it. Uh, but honestly, the ones that voted for that are ones that are actually working that right now. So okay. there, there's a personal reason somewhere for those. I'm just curious, I know our Sheriff's Department does that and uh, it seems to work out fairly well. And uh, that gives you or back to more of a normal Mm -hmm. life schedule if that's such a thing but uh, seeing the two percent kind of shocked me a little bit but I'm like Commissioner Best you know I definitely want the folks that are coming to me my family's aid you know I want them to be rested I know that when I was a, a, a supervisor over at the plant we looked at some shift uh, schedules as well and I know one of the big things that come out of that was safety and alertness as far as folks being rested enough because it's a safety concern for, for you and others. And again, the alertness of when they're uh, giving you care, that they're giving you the care that you actually provide, that need, that you actually need provided to you. So uh, anyway, I'm supportive, you know, whatever you guys decide. I don't know if you're bringing it to us, wanting us to help with that decision or not, but definitely something's needed. I, I do have a concern of hiring those seven extra people but uh, if you feel confident in that, uh, maybe we'll pull some other folks from other counties. But definitely need to do something. I want to take care of those folks. Any other comments? No, I thoroughly reviewed this, and I heard the other commissioners concerns and comments, and uh, I'm supportive of keeping our employees fresh and ready to go to action when when duty calls and uh, just a little side note on a personal side uh, I'm privileged to have a centurion as a neighbor and uh, a couple of weeks ago some of your folks picked her up and uh, I was there standing by and your folks on the ambulance crew handled my centurion neighbor excellent care I commented to them how she was in great great hands with with our folks and, and they were very professional and they took care of her just perfect so thank you for that okay thank you um and just 
you know, to go back and talk about, you know, not wanting to take money out of my folks' pockets that, that want or need and depend on it. Um, just for an example, um, somebody that's working on a schedule, you know, they got 2,900 some hours that they're scheduled to be here. Uh, I've got a couple of employees that have worked 3,800 hours in the physical year, picking up extra shifts. So back to the, their shifts to be picked up if they really want that extra. But I don't want to force folks to be here uh, that 29, 2,900 hours on a schedule if we don't have to. And we can keep the same amount of ambulances, right? Correct. It would the not. Same number of vehicles. It, it would, would not change any, of, change the, any of the service level. Just, I one, guess. just one question. I that, and again, I know you're not here to discuss it, but I saw where we've got a FEMA ambulance and crew here to, to help us during this busy time. Uh, is that working out? Is that working out good? Uh, yeah, correct. They'll, they started here on Friday. Uh, they're working out of the Clyde area. Uh, they're, if you hear them on the radio, they're called Medic 9. Um, they're an ALS ambulance. It's a FEMA contractor. Uh, that FEMA is paying to be here. Uh, there's 68, I think, across the North Carolina right now that are in other counties doing the same thing. Uh, so we're we're glad to have them here to to help manage some of the call volume um, that we're experiencing, as as well as the, the hospital overcrowding that we're experiencing with diversions and and having to go different places and and wait longer periods of time to get patients off our trucks. Yeah. That's Trav keeping our keeping our vehicles tied up out of county, and that that extra vehicle really helps us. Or our numbers, I noticed a data report. It seems like our our numbers on on the COVID situation seem like they're kind of going down. Is that continuing? That trend you're seeing that continuing to go down? I think our case can down still, but uh, it's like uh, Dr. Javen talks about. You know, our case or hospitalizations lag behind the case count. So hopefully in the near future, we'll start to see some hospitalizations drop off. But I, I can tell you that they are still significantly high or higher than what they need to be as far as patients with COVID in the hospital. And I guess we do need to keep in mind, this, is, this will impact our budget almost half a cent if we do this. Yes, uh, it's, it, it's not without uh, a, a cost, but in the long run, I think it, it's puts us in better position to serve the community. And uh, the other thing is, uh, Travis had the, the data showing the, the call volume going up. At some point, our paramedics are not going to get rest overnight because call volume. And this will also make it easier. If it's three years, five years, whenever that we need to move to 12-hour shifts, this, this closes the gap on that 12-hour model if we have to go there eventually. Yeah. And I will tell you, too, that I didn't put it in the presentation. Uh, we look at, in EMS, we look at unit hour utilization. It's basically a formula that figures out how, how much of the time an ambulance is on a call and unavailable to answer a call in its district. And I will tell you that uh, two years ago, we were on average 17% uh, of the time on a call. I've got trucks right now that are 40% of the time on a call, which means that uh, that they're out of their district um, that much. So that's that's okay. something that's that to look at in the near future as well. Travis, just one comment or uh, advertisement, I guess. Commissioner Long uh, mentioned the FEMA truck. That was going to be out and about. Can you tell us how it's marked just so the public, if they, because it, it's different. If they see this truck out and about, they'll know what it is. Yep. Uh, it is a van style truck. It uh, has Ohio Medical Transport on the side of it. It's actually a, a medic, American Medical Response contractor uh, out of Ohio. So that's what it looks like. It's, it looks odd ro roaming around Haywood County with Ohio on it, but that's who they are. And they're, they're some good guys. Thank you. I just know that if some folks see that truck out and about, they probably have some questions. So thank you for that. Go ahead, Brian. Talking about budget concerns and vehicles, diversion has caused us, and, and the call volume increase, typically about 30,000 miles a year, but with the call volume increase and diversion, closer to 50 this year. So 
you know, ambulances will get replaced much quicker, and I think they're, they're closer to 320,000 than they were 280 just a year ago. So, a, a lot of demands on, on the whole system. On that diversion issue, is I noticed that the census for the hospital was showing 73, and we have 120 beds. I mean, it, it's definitely a staffing issue, correct? That, that's my understanding. I, I, I don't have all of the details. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's a. I, I have a lot of opinions on that. Like I've had a lot of opinions about a lot of stuff today. But it's that's very frightening. I think to the public to think that our hospital is on. 100% diversion for days, and really it's a staffing issue, is that the hospital could accommodate more if we had people in there to work those rooms, so. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. Appreciate that update. Okay, I don't have any discussion to the agenda. Does any other commissioners have any of that? Okay, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Does any, does any of the commissioners have any questions on the five items on the consent agenda? Item number two, while Travis is still here, was there any substantial changes to that, or was it is just a pretty a yearly review that you're required to do? The request of approval of the planning committee, but revised bylaws. bylaws. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that uh, the adjustment or the update of the bylaws, uh, those hadn't been touched since early 2000s when the local emergency planning committee was actually implemented as uh, as a requirement uh, through uh, through the government let me pull my notes up and I'll tell you exactly Tommy um, I, I didn't see any red lines or anything on the copy we got I didn't know if there was any changes Need to be discussed. Yeah, there were a few changes in there, but it was verbiage and uh, some organization within within it, updating it from the, the 2001 verbiage that was originally included in there. Um, it was basically just a big um, a big review and uh, bringing it up to date. Thank you. Any other questions on the consent agenda? Here now, and I'll ask for a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. That's unanimous. Okay. And the next, the only item of the regular agenda is to request approval of an annual report for unpaid taxes for the current fiscal year that are liens on property per North Carolina General Statute 105-369A and approved to set the advertising March 30th, 2022 for the delinquent 2021 real estate taxes. And we have our tax collector, Greg West. Welcome, Greg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, commissioners. Um, Mr. Chairman, I am here before you this morning to uh, speak on a couple of items statutorily. Uh, first, General Statute 105-369 requires that the tax collector on the first Monday in February to report to the governing board the total amount of unpaid taxes for the current fiscal year. Uh, as of January 6, which was the first day these became delinquent liens on properties, our remaining balance was $7,259,156. As of this morning, our remaining balance unpaid is $3,000,000. $272,359 for a collection percent of 92.98%. Um, so that is our unpaid balance, 3.2 3 million. Okay. If I can answer any questions about that, it's pretty straight. Greg, is folks still coming in, I guess, at this yes. time? Yeah, it's slowed I hadn't down. I have looked lately at the line, so I wasn't sure. It has slowed down some since, uh, obviously, uh, people trying to get it in before interest accrues and stuff. But, uh, yeah, it's still trickling in. And we'll be sending out our delinquent notices uh, around February the 24th. So, obviously, we'll see, should see an uptick then, there as well. So, 
uh, yeah, we're still collecting. If there aren't any other questions, Mr. Chairman, I would like to request an advertising date of March 30th to advertise the past due property in our local newspaper. Okay. Does anyone uh, have any questions about on that? And can they, anyone make a motion? I'll make that motion. Okay, is there second. A second? Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Greg. Thank you. Okay, next order of business is appointments, and we'll, I'll turn it over to the county manager. We have three appointments. Go ahead, Brian. Okay. Mr. Chairman, the, the first is to appoint uh, Sheriff's Office Lieutenant Matt Shell to the CCPT slash CFPT as a law enforcement representative through uh, retirements. Uh, we, we've lost a couple of, uh, of those representatives, and the sheriff has uh, recommended uh, Lieutenant Shell to serve on that through his experience with uh, child cases and criminal investigations. Okay. Can I have a motion to approve item one? So moved. Say. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Go ahead, Brian, for number two. The next would be to appoint, uh, reappoint Kevin Fitzgerald to the Recreation Advisory Board. Uh, this comes from the, the actual board itself to request that special concession be made to waive uh, policies uh, if because of his experience and understanding uh, if he's not reappointed uh, it would be a, a, a hardship to the uh, the committee and I know Commissioner Rogers is on that board if he has something to say no I just I know Kevin very well and uh, as you pointed out there would be a huge hole or a huge void there if Kevin wasn't on that board he's very active uh, very dedicated, and uh, I would highly recommend them. By the way, if they ain't got any other questions, I'll actually make that motion that we do. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, and number three, Brian. It's uh, to appoint uh, Kathy Odvody to the vacant at large position to fill uh, an un unexpired term that ends 4 6 23. Uh, currently, she uh, works for the chair of the outdoor missions community and uh, also uh, does hiking guides for parks and rec now so um, the, the uh, Greenway Commission is requesting that she would be uh, appointed to fulfill that uh, unexpired term okay is there a motion to do that so move say okay all those in favor say aye, aye. 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 okay that's unanimous their business before the board. Does anybody, commissioners or just county manager, have anything? <laughs> okay. I'll entertain a motion. We adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Oh, we are adjourned. Thank you.